Are we there? <clears throat> yes, we are. Okay, good. Uh, this is Doug Brown speaking, and I would like to call the meeting to order. Uh, I understand we have a full participation from the regents, but to confirm with each regent in order, please say, uh, announce themselves. This is Doug Brown, uh, Kim Sanchez Real. I'm present. Okay, and uh, uh, Sandra Begay. I'm present. And uh, Marin Lee. Present. And uh, Rob Doty. I'm present. Melissa Henry. Unmute. <laughs> and Rob Schwartz. Present. <clears throat> okay, Melissa Henry is present. I will assume so in any event we have a quorum and the uh, first item on business is the approval of the agenda for this meeting and uh, do I have a motion to that effect? No, uh, Regent Brown, I would like to move something off the consent docket. This is Marin. Well, I think we can do that when we get to the consent. Well, it do you wanna, do, do you wanna, uh, if we approve the agenda, the, doesn't the consent docket stay as the consent docket? Uh, no, I, 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 any regent can, I think uh, Rob Doty very helpfully pointed out that any regent can move an item off of the consent agenda. During right, the but we approve the consent agenda when, if we approve the agenda. So it's a change to the agenda. Okay. Well, if you'd like, we can at this point formalize that items F, G, I, and J um, are to be removed from the consent agenda and discussed However, that does not preclude other items that other regions might want to have brought forward uh, at the time the consent agenda is uh, discussed. Well, and I want to remove A from the consent agenda, the cons constitutional amendment from AZAR. Okay. All right. Let's do that too. Thank you. Okay. Do we have, all right. With those adjustments to the agenda, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Uh -huh. Okay, and I'll take the other, I'll take Marin's then as a second. A any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye by roll count. Rob? Yes. And Marin, yes, because you yes, yes. motioned it. Um, Rob Schwartz? Yes. M Melissa Henry? She maybe disappeared. Um, Sandra Begay? Yes. Kim Sanchez Real? Yes. And Doug Brown, I vote yes. Okay, we now have the agenda approved. Let's go on to the minutes of the March 9th regular meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Okay, second. Second. okay second. second from Sandra. Yes. Um, any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye by roll. We've got Kim and, and Sandra down. Uh, Rob Doty? Aye. Marin Lee? Aye. Rob uh, Sanchez. Schwartz. And Schwartz is aye. And, and uh, Rob Schwartz, I'm sorry. And Doug Brown says yes. Is, is uh, Melissa Henry, is, is she on or muted? Regent Brown, um, Regent Henry is on, but her mic does not seem to be working. Okay. Well, uh, we've got six out of seven, so we'll have her as, a, as an abstention, I suppose. Okay, let's uh, talk about the uh, approval of the meeting schedule for the year 2021, which will be up on your screen. And I have to say as a preamble that um, clearly it's not gonna be five months until we have another Board of Regents meeting and in all likelihood we'll have one or more special meetings uh, when we know more about any budget revisions that will be upon us. Um, Loretta, did you have further comments at this point about the meeting schedule? Uh, yes, and Regent Brown, did you want me to take a moment to talk about sort of the rules of the road for virtual meetings and the authority that, that, we have under? That would be okay. helpful. All right, well, um, this may likely be, so a bit of a historic moment, the first all virtual Board of Regents meeting at UNM. And um, we are able to do that under the authority of guidance that the Attorney General issued on March 17th when the um, stay at home orders and COVID-19 issues were coming to a head in New Mexico and around the world. 
So Attorney General Valderas has agreed that per the Open Meetings Act, boards of governors like the UNM Board of Regents can hold virtual meetings, provided that the public is given access to attend. And there's a couple um, rules that this board should follow, and those include that the board members should identify themselves when they are speaking. And you have to remember that there are a number of attendees that may not have access to the video, and so it is helpful for them to know who is speaking. So I would say that all speakers should identify themselves. Um, all votes need to be done by roll call vote. Um, the institution needs to maintain a recording of this meeting, which we are doing. And uh, the last couple pieces are that we have um, worked very diligently and particularly Mallory Revere and the um, IT staff to make this meeting as close as possible to our in-person meetings, including at a point in the agenda a little later, allowing live public comment. Um, so I want to thank um, all of those folks for their hard work. And the last thing that I would say about a virtual meeting format, this is not from the AG, this is just etiquette as we all learn to live virtually, is to please um, mute your phones any time that you are not speaking in order to reduce um, any background noises that may occur. Um, Chairman Brown, did I cover what you needed in regard to virtual meetings or are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, let's ask if there's any questions. Questions from the regents? Hearing none, let us, hi, Melissa. <laughs> Sorry for the grief. Hi, Doug, can you hear me now? We yeah. can hear you loud and clear. Awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, let us have a vote to approve the meeting schedule for 20, 20, 2021. Uh, is there a motion to that effect? A motion to approve. Okay, from Sandra, and we'll, Melissa will take your comment as a second. Um, all, the, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye by roll. Um, Sandra and Melissa, we've got your role there. Um, Rob Doty. Let's go on, Rob Schwartz. Aye, aye sorry. <laughs> Rob Schwartz. Aye. Melissa, Henry. Aye. Kim Sanchez-Real. Aye. Marin Lee. Aye. All right, then the motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on now to administrative report, ministers, administrator's report by President uh, Stokes. President Stokes. Good morning, everyone from University House on our beautiful UNM campus. Um, yeah, things have changed a lot since we last were together. Um, the whole world has changed for us. But frankly, it has been remarkable to see the hard work and the resilience of our faculty, staff, and students as we have uh, moved forward to completely upend everything that we do. Um, I'm very, uh, I'm hoping to spend time then on this report, kind of sharing with you some of the things that we have been focused on uh, quite a bit here. So I'll try not to move too fast, but uh, uh, you know, I do have a lot of ground to cover given the number of activities in the last couple of months. So the next slide, you know, we're going to focus here initially on what we've done to protect the pack during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So on the next slide, um, you'll see that, and, and I'm hoping it's, it's, it's kind of a challenge to read these from my perspective. I don't know how big your screen is, um, but I'll try to be descriptive of the things that are, that are up there. Um, you know, of course, it's been a stressful time and it's interesting to look at this timeline and realize that on the 31st of January, we sent out a notification to, uh, to the UNM community talking about COVID and uh, what was going on in China. Um, you know, at that time, there were six cases in the United States and there was a belief that there really was no threat, uh, very little threat to this country. Um, move ahead, uh, you know, uh, not very <laughs> far later on the 3rd of March, um, we uh, had announcements that, about a coronavirus web page. So we launched some information to our community. Um, then uh, we, uh, we are using the wrong terms here because it created confusion when we said we were extending spring break. Uh, we made that announcement on the 13th of March. 
And uh, really it was just an extended spring break for those who were actually taking on-campus classes and not for those online. You know, one of the first of many lessons in, uh, in clarity of communication to a community. Um, but, you know, always, always new lessons to learn. Uh, you know, on 17th of March, uh, the limited operations were announced. And then on the 23rd of March, Governor Lujan Grisham issued the stay at home orders. Um, we ended up uh, making decisions to postpone commencement. Uh, you can see here that uh, we went to a period of remote instruction that was initially uh, to a date in April, but then we um, really have continued to extend the transitions and the, uh, extend our period of remote operations. On the 8th of April, we actually restricted access to the Albuquerque campus. Uh, asking that people, allowing our communities to walk through campus, ride their bikes, their, you know, their skateboards, and the many ways people traverse our campus, but really trying to protect our facilities and our, our grounds. Um, then we've extended the limited operations first to May 16th, but now we've just announced that we will extend those limited operations until June 1st. Uh, what else have we been doing? The next slide tells you the massive efforts. Um, Mallory, thank you. Uh, the massive efforts to provide for patient care, um, to increase capacity at both UNMH and SRMC. Uh, the pediatric areas were converted to uh, adult ICUs. A women's care clinic was uh, uh, converted for COVID-19 non-ICUs and and a conference room, and many of you have been over and uh, uh, at the hospital and been in that conference room a lot, it was converted to a respiratory care center. Um, a lot of changes been over to the hospital. You'll see numerous physical changes and, uh, and controlled access. Um, there were plans developed to increase ICU capacity. Um, there was a separate post-recovery COVID-19 clinic. Um, uh, one of the challenges uh, with, uh, that I heard about sitting in on uh, the HSC incident management team, uh, regular eight o'clock meetings, was just how lonely some people were in ICU. So creating opportunities for family visits via technology um, was a very positive thing that was provided. Um, also for the physicians themselves and nurses and other healthcare workers to um, have conversations. Uh, and then there was a specific COVID-19 bereavement program that was set up. There was a lot of statewide engagement too in the next slide. Um, uh, very much involved with uh, testing and collaboration across the three health systems. We had a robust reference laboratory that was formed just 20 years ago. Um, it's a partnership between UNM hospitals and Presbyterian and working with TRICARE has been of enormous benefit to the entire state of New Mexico uh, and certainly uh, uh, to, to the UNM. Um, also really concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on the homeless. And so uh, UNM has been involved with that. Um, the city of Albuquerque uh, formerly deputized uh, Dr. Laura uh, Potahome, uh, who's the executive director of UNM's Office of Community Health to serve as a medical director for that West Side shelter. Um, so there've been, uh, and then of course, our Office of Medical Investigator has been serving in statewide operations um, with storage capacity and protocols for autopsies. So they've been very active. We have some other state run initiatives that I'll focus on in the next slide. Um, we've had uh, a lot of leadership providing expertise across the state. Um, the medical advisory team was a facilitated uh, statewide health system coordination uh, that was led by uh, um, Mike Richards was part of that. Other leaders were Laura Banks and Christine Vieto and uh, Christoph Lambert, Rob Schwartz was part of it. A lot of work groups working uh, on the issues for uh, creating a healthcare network in the state of New Mexico. Um, so that, uh, that hub and spoke system that they created, uh, that has been created at the state level has been really good. The Navajo Nation response team, you know, has included uh, Dr. Roth and Dr. Lathrop, uh, dealing specifically with the issues in the Navajo Nation. And in the next slide, some repeat of this, but 
you know, uh, again, Dr. Roth has been serving for this national rapid response team. Art Kaufman and Tassie Parker are leading a group to coordinate outreach to the Native Communities uh, Prevention Research Center, um, has collaborations in rural communities, um, lots of collaboration at Gallup, and, and we know how serious the issues are there. Of course, the collaboration to produce masks and, and shields, I think, uh, for, uh, for people in various communities. That was a, a partnership, really, um, that I'll talk more about on, on the next slide, but also the HEROES, uh, that uh, system of having healthcare people in all the communities or the, the counties in the state, like a, uh, much like the ag model of extension, um, and that Art Kaufman has been doing has really been helping in these underserved communities. And I wanted to mention specifically in the next slide that, that special engineering uh, and that engineering uh, work that was done in concert with HSC. We had people across the across the university that helped to produce. Um, uh, these uh, devices, this PPE for people. And there was a wonderful story, thank you, Chamisa, for pointing it out to me, uh, on the front page of today's Albuquerque Journal. Um, you know, Christina Salas has done great work and, and, uh, and, and they took all this work out to Gallup and met with Patty Lundstrom, uh, Representative Chairwoman Lundstrom, and, uh, and, and others uh, in the Gallup community. But Laura Schaefer is a flight nurse and was also instrumental in a lot of the work that they're doing. So if you read the Albuquerque Journal, and I hope you do, um, great front page article, very, very positive story. Uh, next, uh, we've also been involved in a lot of national and international work. Uh, Project ECHO, of course, has always had a, a, a presence nationally and internationally but they've created infectious disease office hours, critical care office hours. I mean, it, what they're doing is tremendous in serving uh, an entire globe affected by COVID-19. We also, of course, continue doing tremendous research and we have, uh, last count I had, 43 COVID-19 related research projects. We have clinical trials um, related to some of the treatments, uh, um, uh, for COVID. We're uh, looking at genomic sequencing of the virus. We've got vaccine work going on. Um, we have a P30 COVID-19 supplement grant. So lots of work. And in addition, we are participating in an observational health data sources and informatics with 10 countries. The, the goal here is to really figure out what are the safe and effective treatments. And what we know in terms of our future is that it is going to be about our ability to effectively treat this virus until we have a vaccine. And so uh, this work I view is very, very crucial for, for us and for all of us in the future. We've also, in the next slide, you'll see we've been providing healthcare worker support. We provided temporary housing in our residence halls. Um, we've developed collaborative campus efforts to decontaminate PPE for reuse. Um, offered wellness programs. We actually ended up consolidating our UNM and UNMH occupational health offices so that we could provide expedited testing and contact tracing because these are absolutely essential to our abilities um, to respond effectively to this, to this pandemic. Um, I do wanna say on behalf of the entire university, um, and I wanna extend a resounding and profound thank you to all of our healthcare workers. They've um, really amazingly stepped up. And so the community, as you'll see in the next slide, you'll see all sorts of pictures to see the extent to which uh, people have stepped up. We had, um, we've had drive-by salutes by the Albuquerque Fire Department. We've had, I wanna mention specifically, 17-year-old uh, Sam Neal, who's the son of our very own real estate director, Tom Neal, um, battled cancer and was chosen by Make-A-Wish Foundation to make a wish, and his wish was to do something for healthcare workers. So I think that says a great deal about people in our communities. And people wanna know what to do. Well, one thing is you can send get well cards to COVID-19 patients. So on the next slide, uh, we talk about uh, the swift move we've had to make to remote instruction. 83% of courses were moved, 17% were already online. Um, and that took place within a very short period of time. You can see the numbers on the slide. Um, 
then we have a tracking system to help monitor progress. Uh, so we'll use that forever. This has been really, really uh, a, good, a good system. On the next slide, you'll see that one of the things that happened was that our faculty senate took leadership here. It was remarkable. Uh, other institutions, the leadership is coming from the administration, but what I was pleased about is our faculty led this, um, uh, this approach to uh, getting faculty to be flexible with students, to work on the credit, no credit grading, um, uh, and, and really to encourage faculty to help our students be successful and complete their coursework. We also did an assessment of student needs, which guided us in the things that we did for our students. Um, we also knew how difficult this transition was going to be. The difficult would be difficult for our faculty and our students. And so uh, we created a special student faculty facilitation network. Um, I'm really grateful to leadership in the provost office and, and Asada Zarai, our vice president for equity and inclusion really recognized how important this would be. And uh, they've been able to facilitate issues between faculty and students that are just made more difficult by our circumstances. Um, and Rodney Bow is serving as a facilitation coordinator. We've given out a lot of laptops, uh, uh, a lot of mini scholarships. We have an early alert uh, system for students. Um, and we provided additional support for doctoral students by extending deadlines for them. Over in the health sciences in the next slide, uh, they too have continued uh, uh, educational experiences with electronic curriculum delivery. The biggest issue, one of the huge issues of course in health sciences is the use of clinical venues. And so we've had to deal on main campus and, and of course on the health sciences uh, with the laboratory venues, but a lot of students have had to be, have been removed from those on both uh, uh, on all parts of the UNM. We've organized volunteer opportunities. We've trained uh, College of Pharmacy students to help uh, staff an, uh, a poison control hotline with COVID-19 questions. Um, for additional student support on the next slide, we distributed 8.6 million uh, in the CARES Act uh, in emergency support. The students were really grateful. We based it on an expected family contribution um, and so had two different levels of support that you can see on the slide. Um, and we've been distributing to our undocumented and DACA students who filed financial aid. Uh, we've distributed funding to them from other sources. Um, uh, originally, they thought the CARES Act money could go to them. They later clarified um, that we couldn't, but we had already made the decision to be, um, to be safe with what they might be expecting and, and, uh, and find our own resources to provide those funds. Um, we're also planning for a free late summer one credit course. What we know is that students really haven't been, uh, 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 they, they really haven't been uh, necessarily, they're not gonna be quite as ready for fall semester. That's true for our, for our students coming in. Uh, so we wanna help students get ready to be back in school in the fall. Uh, in the School of Medicine, for the next slide, uh, they created a COVID-19 block for medical students. And they've been doing a lot of different work in that area. Uh, educational sessions for teachers, um, they created that. They created podcast segments uh, so that people could get information they could easily understand. So great work from our, our medical students. Uh, in the next slide, um, you know, this would have never happened. We could have never done it if it hadn't been for incredible crew uh, in information technologies. And I know there was a question at the beginning, can we really do this? Well, it turns out we can. So they have absolutely stepped up. Um, they've uh, been great partners across the university. Um, they have 180 staff, 120 students. They support 24,000 computers on main and branch campuses. Before COVID, we had Zoom users and meetings, about 2,000 users, about 2,600 meetings. Uh, since COVID or during COVID, we have 11,270 users and 44,000 meetings a month. So our lives have changed, haven't they? Uh, thank you to a great UNM team uh, uh, at IT. So that yeah, couldn't have done this without them. Our branches remain busy. They each sent us a little bit of an update of what they were doing, which you can see on the slide. 
Um, of course, Gallup has rescheduled their graduation. In fact, everybody is really doing something else for, uh, for their commencement ceremonies. Uh, and, and they each really work to, to um, intervene and allow their students to be successful. So you can see some, some things that they've done, like you know, hosting virtual open houses, allowing opportunities for students to get information they need, to establish an online one credit temporary nurse aid course, finish that, go immediately into the workforce, meeting a, a serious need in the community. We have also been providing faculty and staff support in the next slide. You'll see that listed. Tiered staff, we created tiers one, two, and three. Um, we wanted to help bend this curve and, and we've been successful in doing so. Issued Zoom Pro licenses, provided support for teaching and research. Um, developed a child care, a surge child care clinic uh, or alternatives for our tier one employees. Child care has turned out to be one of the major issues for people. Uh, and the tier one employees are the ones who are having to be on campus or in place. And so we needed to be able to help them and we're able to place more than 400 children and a lot of, uh, a lot of staff were involved in that, really pleased with their great work in organizing it. Also, in terms of ongoing faculty support, issues with tenure, we made the decision uh, to automatically extend the tenure clock for faculty. They can, of course, choose not to use it, but it'll be automatically extended because what we know is that this has completely upended the work of our faculty on the tenure track uh, as they attempt to reach uh, the, the final stages of actually earning tenure. So we're doing several things to help our faculty um, be successful down the road with their promotion tenure. Of course, this year's went as scheduled. Um, we do have some additional things that our faculty are concerned about. You know, our newer faculty that have startup funds, you know, some of them are told they had to spend them within a period of time. So we're working with our faculty. Uh, we recognize that, you know, many of them are working at home and that has created a lot of extra duties. People are now doing lots of work. We've seen some some research that shows that um, this has been an especially challenging time for many women uh, faculty and uh, and then of course people are missing their research travel. So these are things that we'll be dealing with. In terms of thinking about the fall, um, contingency planning is what we're doing. Um, you know, if you, if you talk across the country and I've spent time uh, speaking uh, with presidents across the country and many of the national organizations I know other leaders, uh, James has been talking to provosts across the country, um, you know, and there are lots of different plans going on. Um, uh, there is a, a chronicle uh, survey of people, uh, different institutions, and I believe it was, I'm looking for the figures here, 73% are currently planning to offer in-person classes, but even those that are planning that are preparing for something else. Many of them are waiting till July to actually say exactly what they're going to do. Because our reality is that we all want to offer classes, but we recognize that there will be changing circumstances in the weeks to come. We are going to learn things that will influence our decision making. We, of course, plan to align with state government and with the city. Um, we'll be guided by the principles of protecting the health of everyone um, in our community. Um, also, though, to, uh, to fulfill our deep-rooted mission to educate and to do research and create and serve people uh, and to protect the university's future, um, which, you know, we'll be navigating this for months to come. Of course, the state has a three-phase plan. We think higher education is going to come into this a little bit later. Um, and all of this is predicated on a full surveillance system of testing and contact tracing. And right now, um, we don't believe that, right now we know we don't have a testing system that is, that is large enough for us to really uh, implement across the board. In the next slide, you'll see uh, that there has been an HED draft uh, reopening plans that was created by uh, Kathy, uh, Dr. Kathy Winograd um, in response to a request from the governor. And what she did is she spoke to all the presidents and chancellors across the, the state, uh, created a plan for reopening higher education 
Um, of course, we've been open. We are doing higher education. We're really talking about return to campus. Um, and you see a timeline here on the slide with uh, our current situation is we're still in the COVID-19 emergency, but starting to talk about emerging. Um, but as you know, we've already moved our timeline a little later and the governor had staff did request a little later uh, movement into phase one for higher education. So we continue to um, work closely with, um, with the health people and the governor's office to uh, make sure that our timelines align uh, in ways that serve our community and, and the state in general. So um, lots of issues facing higher education. Um, I mean, it's really uh, very difficult to, to, to plan. So we have to plan for lots of different contingencies. And so our planning for fall and next spring, we're kind of assuming that we might be able to have uh, in large enough spaces environments that have no more than 50 people, but those numbers could be different. We're going to develop multiple approaches to social distancing. We're talking about one way, one way hallways. Uh, I mean, there are all sorts of changes to the physical environment, all sorts of changes to behavior that we will have to institute and then train everyone on, you know, in terms of cleaning up spaces and wearing masks and so um, we will be in the summer, we plan to use some of the CARES Act money that we expect to get uh, to provide summer training on remote instruction because what we want going into the fall is for all of our faculty to be fully prepared to offer an exceptional online educational environment in case that's what we have to do for some part of fall semester or and or spring semester. So uh, a lot going on, we're exploring whether we should require laptops for students. So now the next slide, you know, there's a lot of interest in all the modeling that's going on. Um, everyone has read a lot about the uh, epidemiological modeling. Um, and so we're probably all learning a great deal about these mathematical models. Um, some are based on forecasting, some are based on projecting. They actually lead to vast differences in, in, uh, in those projections. Um, so uh, the New Mexico Department of Health has been relying significantly on the Los Alamos Labs National, uh, their forecasting. So I thought it, I'd highlight a little bit of their work. Um, the bars to the left of May 10th are actual daily reported new cases and the lines are the LANO projections. So what you can see is a, the, the projected line that they provided on, the, on April uh, 12th. And then down below, you see the line, and you can see it's definitely going down, the projections for May 6th. And if you go to the next slide, what you'll see on the next slide is these are all the projections based on all of, uh, all, all of the reports. And so you see that these models have been changing. There's a little bit of an uptick. Uh, really on May 6th, but you can see that the models keep having us going down and down and down. Um, each measurement period since April 12th, it, it, it represents that we would be below 50 new cases a day by the end of June. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, um, and, and, and what we know is all the work uh, associated with what happens is one lifts restrictions. And so, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, the the little uptick on May 6th, that's part of why there's been so much effort to tell people they started moving around too soon. And, you know, I think, I think for us, that's, that, you know, remains one of our most serious concerns. Um, and yet we know the costs of, of, uh, of not opening up. And so we know that we're dealing with some really um, serious, serious decisions that, have, that are being made. And I think uh, going to the next slide, you know, all of this is what's created so much stress for people. And we've been uh, very much aware of what this has meant for our community, for our students, our staff and faculty, for those around us. So we've tried to be sure that everyone's aware of the, of the uh, resources that we have available. The Agora Crisis Center, of course, is the oldest campus-based crisis center in the U.S. and they've continued to field calls. Uh, on their helpline and offer emotional support via online chat. Of course,
course, our shack is still in operation remotely. If you go by there, you see there are ways to get in with appropriate social distancing. Um, we have our, uh, our cars, which uh, serves our, uh, our staff and faculty, and we're just doing everything possible to support the mental health of, of, our, of our entire community. On the next slide, you know, additional resources, we realized just how, uh, how much impact there's been on the community. So I'm really pleased with our Division of Equity and Inclusion created a series on uh, climate for COVID-19. And you see here some, um, uh, some, of, some of the things in the series, the impact on students, faculty, and staff. Um, there have been specific issues around our Asian and Pacific Island, Islanders because of some of the uh, political tensions around, uh, uh, around the virus. And, uh, and then the upcoming one on parenting in a pandemic, I suspect that will be well received because I know it's been a challenge. So speaking of challenges, uh, there are serious fiscal implications of COVID-19. And on the next slide, you will see that this is a visualization of the most recent state revenue forecast. I think this was uh, based on May 5th information. Uh, and it really just tells us what we already knew. That little teal dotted line, you know, that was the December 2019 consensus forecast um, for uh, the state. Um, the, uh, the top kind of light salmon, orange, whatever we call that, that is a, uh, based on a U-shaped recovery scenario that uh, was worked out in, by this consensus revenue estimating group that includes the Legislative Finance Committee, the Taxation Revenue Department, and, and other entities, including our own uh, UNM Bureau of Business and Economic Research that provides, uh, is a contributor to the data. Um, the U-shaped, uh, so we've got the U-shaped recovery scenario, we've got the L-shaped recovery scenario. Um, and then of course the gold bars themselves reflect uh, recurring, uh, really recurring revenues and appropriations. So what you can see is that certainly for FY21, uh, the expectation for revenues, depending upon which model we rely on, is vastly lower than the actual, uh, than, than, uh, than what was appropriated uh, and expected to be appropriated for FY21, which is why we're sure there'll be a special session. Uh, we're expecting a special session and a lot of really difficult work uh, in, the, in the weeks and months to come. The, um, the L-shaped recovery uh, does actually show a deeper and more prolonged issue with, uh, with our economic contraction, but that is more like the what New Mexico experienced uh, in, uh, in the last major recession. And of course, this could all be, this will all be affected by a lot of different outcomes. A lot of different factors are gonna influence where we land. We don't know what's going to happen with the virus. Um, what are the strategies going to be for opening up the economies? Um, how long will it take for consumers to be comfortable uh, and therefore spending? Um, how, uh, how much of the temporary layoffs end up being permanent? What happens to oil prices? There's just a tremendous amount of uncertainty and that uncertainty will continue in the months to come. We are working with CUP. We meet weekly with, uh, with the um, Legislative Finance Committee rep, with the governor's rep, um, with DFA to, to really talk about where things seem to be going. Um, the recurring revenue in FY21 could drop 1.8 to 2.4 billion. And uh, recurring revenue in FY22 um, uh, stands to be 17% to 28% below the FY21 operating budget. So, you know, this just tells us what we realize, tough times ahead, lots of decisions that we'll have to make uh, for higher education and here at UNM. Uh, what's the impact to UNM at this point? On the next slide, um, for those of you at FNF, you saw a table version of this. This is what is called a waterfall chart. Thank you to my chief of staff for sharing all sorts of ways that I can depict information. Um, some people probably like the chart they got at FNF, but this basically waterfall chart says from left to right, what you see is a running net impact of each added or subtracted 
uh, amount of money to, uh, for our resources. I want to note that the very top line is actually the zero mark. So, you know, what you're seeing is really how much money has been lost and added for various types of issues. So that first one is related to the loss of revenue because of re, uh, returning housing uh, refunds and food service refunds to our students. Um, the second part is the loss related to event cancellation and other types of services. Then uh, the next is uh, related to other types of travel, things we couldn't get reimbursed for, all, all sorts of things. Um, you know, the, met, the main and branch net uh, impact is negative 9.6 million. Uh, on the HSC side, you know, much bigger numbers, as you can expect. Uh, the academic net was a uh, loss is about 17.4 million. It's our hospital that uh, has really seen that decline. Also seen some, some monies have been given to us to help us in this time. But all that does is kind of close what was really a, an $80 million gap to something closer to 50 million. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, we will likely see some recovery uh, uh, as the hospital is able to start doing more elective procedures. Um, but, you know, it, we don't know how quickly that will occur. So the total is the last column there. Um, the total impact to UNM is a negative 49.8 million. And this is a real challenge for us, quite honestly, because um, when we are in conversations with, uh, with legislative finance committee and, and others, there's a sense that um, we're getting all this money from the federal government. So um, we can afford perhaps to, to be cut, but our reality is that um, the impact on us is going, is very, very significant. And uh, that impact is likely to continue. So helping us give the word that, you know, institutions of higher education, UN in, in particular, um, has seen huge financial hits from this COVID uh, epidemic, uh, pandemic. So on the next slide, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this a little quicker. And, and if you want more information on this, I'll, I'd be happy to send it to you and talk with you. But just know that there have been a lot of congressional interventions. There have been a lot of focus by the federal government on various packages. And it's pretty impressive that three major packages were actually passed um, at the federal level to provide aid of different sorts uh, throughout the country. Phase four is probably going to be a little more of a challenge. I'm not really clear that higher education will see much benefit from phase four. And, and it does look like things are going to be a little more politically fraught um, uh, as they are discussing it. On the next slide is just a visual of where the funding really has gone. And what you can see here is that much of it uh, from the federal government has really gone to individuals and to large corporations with smaller amounts going to, to the small businesses and state and local governments and public health. You see here that about 14 billion went to higher education. Um, and so, uh, and, and I think we are sharing with you some of what has ended up coming to, uh, to UNM. So in the next, uh, the next slide, uh, the current status as of last week, um, we did receive the 8.6. We gave it directly to students, as I've already said. We're still waiting for the other 8.6 million from, uh, from the CARES Act. And we also have 1.3 million pending for being a, a minority serving institution and then a Hispanic serving institution. And then UNMH received some, uh, some relief, emergency relief. Um, you know, lots of things going on and a lot of things still not supported through federal funding. Our research programs, we're still trying to really work hard with our congressional delegation uh, to, uh, to get additional help for, um, uh, for our programs and our operations needs. Um, and, and then of course, we've got the issues about uh, you know, being, having been slow to respond to what's happening uh, on our tribal lands, which has a huge impact in New Mexico and at UNM, given uh, our large number of, of students, faculty, and staff uh, who are uh, part of that Native population. Um, I'm really grateful to our congressional delegation. They've really worked hard for us. 
um, and our government relations people have been, you know, fantastic trying to really stay on top of this. So things still go on uh, in spite of all of this work, all of this work, new work for the institution. We have been able to, you know, get some leader, new leaders uh, uh, hired and they'll be starting soon. On the next slide, you'll see we've, uh, our provost has been very busy um, on the next slide with the hiring of three new deans. Um, looks like uh, Texas Tech is not gonna like us very much because a couple of them came from there. I um, wonder what's going on there, but anyway, um, really delighted that we've got uh, Hansel Burley, Mitzi Montoya, and Robert Gonzalez um, coming to coming and all starting on July 1st. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, ongoing executive searches do the ongoing search for the Dean of College of Fine Arts and then the Executive VP for Health Sciences. Um, Provost Holloway, great job. Thank you. And all the members of these search committees, because they've been finishing up this work under, uh, I, I guess you have to say, trying conditions uh, um, might be the way to put it. So next, uh, you know, I want to continue to celebrate success because we've been getting good news and doing lots of great things. Um, celebrating the class of 2020 in the next slide, you already know that uh, we checked with our students. They wanted us to do an on-campus commencement. They wanted us to do it in August. Um, they really didn't want a virtual celebration, but looking ahead and reading the tea leaves, it was clear that we couldn't promise an in-person commencement for, for August. So we are launching a virtual celebration. Um, they will, members of the class will be able to participate on May 30th at 9 a.m. Uh, and, and then they'll have a future live. We don't know when it'll be, you know, because we're not going to do it until it's really safe to do it. Um, I've been individual colleges and units have been doing all sorts of variations on celebrations of, of graduation. So I've been really delighted with the uh, ingenuity of our folks, how just how, uh, how they've adapted to, to technology and found ways to try to celebrate. None of it replaces what our students wanted which was in person, family and friends, you know, truly walking across the stage, you know, picking up a stole, a, a diploma cover. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to a time again when we can do that celebration. Certainly the class of 2020 will go down in, in, uh, in UNM's history. There's no question about that. So uh, next, I think, uh, the next slide. We did have a video, but it turns out we can't do video. We couldn't get it to work. Just could not. So um, we're skipping the lovely video you were supposed to see. Uh, and we go directly to something that was incredible news for us, which is that Carlton Caves, one of our emeritus research professors, uh, was admitted to the National Academy of Sciences. There is really no higher honor. Uh, for someone in the sciences to be uh, uh, entered into the National Academy. Uh, the whole universities uh, weigh their excellence by how many National Academy members they actually have. It's one of the indicators of, of greatness for a university. So we're very proud of Professor Caves and his work and, and the recognition and, and glory he really brings to UNM uh, with his great achievements. Uh, the next slide, uh, we celebrated the great work of our UNM inventors. Uh, we were supposed to do it in person, but the celebration turned out to be uh, online. And I just want to say congratulations to the 57 inventors who had uh, issued U.S. patents. That's remarkable. We are excellent in this area. We really do well as a university. On the next slide, another really prestigious fellowship, the Guggenheim. Uh, in the arts and humanities, they're really, this is one of the highest honors to achieve. And so uh, I was really pleased when Dr. Jose Luis uh, Hurtado, uh, an associate professor of music, was recognized. Um, uh, his, he, there were, you know, 3,000 applications, only 175 fellowships in the country. So really, really impressive that uh, he was recognized. In the next slide, you'll see that our athletics group, I can't tell you how proud I am of what they have been doing to engage in public service. Um, they have been on the front lines uh, working with Albertsons to get funding. Um, uh, they've, I'm getting ahead of myself. They worked with, uh, on a food drive with Albertsons to raise money for our Lobo food pantry. 
Uh, the Lobo Club has donated money um, uh, from local restaurants and provided meals to healthcare workers. And then Lobo Rewind, on April 18th, uh, we broadcast a replay of the 2007 New Mexico Bowl. Uh, it was broadcast on Facebook and Twitter. It was our first bowl win in 46 years. So I think people had been, I bet you they're really excited in 2007. I wish I'd been here in 2007. Um, uh, we beat Nevada. Rocky was the coach at the time and Danny was an assistant. So uh, they did live commentary throughout it. Uh, I think at its height, they had 500 people on live, but they've had more than 15,000 people view this on Facebook. And uh, so I think that's pr a pretty impressive uh, impact uh, and ways to stay engaged during you know, this, this pandemic. Next slide, we've been doing a lot of communication, town halls. We had uh, um, the next, uh, yeah, I kind of missed something here. Um, we uh, had a virtual town hall. Uh, that had about 2,400 people attend it. Dr. Roth has been doing a lot of chancellor chats. And then uh, we do have a really important town hall that virtual town hall is gonna be taking place today. Um, the Division uh, for Equity and Inclusion is hosting um, the Addressing Anti-Blackness at UNM. Uh, that's from 4.30 to six today. You know, this is in response to the really horrific racial messages, um, anti-black messages that were sent to one of our faculty members and to people in our libraries. who were talking horrific, uh, horrific uh, stuff. And, and, and so, you know, it's time for us to really listen to our community. Uh, and, uh, and this is an opportunity for us to listen and learn and figure out, you know, where do we go from here? You know, and how do we really step in and improve the situation? Uh, because we know what happened uh, with those messages. It's not the first time, you know, we want it to be the last. So how do we get there? And what do we have to do as a community to make that happen? The next slide is about enrollment. We're already gonna do an enrollment presentation. So I'm really just here focusing on the fact that, you know, all across the country, Students are asking questions. They're unsure about their futures. They're making decisions about whether to come back, whether to even start college. And, and so this particular slide, I thought I would just mention to you, uh, uh, is an indication of who it is the students might be listening to um, as they think about their futures. Um, this, these are poll results of 1,171 high school seniors that were taken between April 21 and, and April 24th. And it looks like they put their greatest trust in public health experts and organizations. That's great news that that's who high school students are listening to. But I tell you what really warmed my heart. Their, their second greatest trust is in college or university administration. Now, I don't know what to tell you, but that, that's, uh, that I, I just had to share that with you. So I'm not gonna read the rest of these, uh, you know, cause this was a national survey. So, but I just wanted you to know uh, students are paying attention in the, in, in the right places, it looks like. So that gives us some hope. On the next slide, um, I, I'm just mentioning that we are moving ahead with summer and fall course registration. We're doing all this online. Summer, of course, is online for the first session and for the through session. We're still looking at what might happen for the second session. Um, uh, students are registering. Uh, and we'll continue to monitor conditions uh, um, as we go forward, as we get toward fall semester. Um, and the next slide, I just wanted to let you know that I received the task force, the, uh, the task force on institutional ethics and integrity that um, we put together last year. Uh, they have provided me with their report. So uh, in the near future, I'm reading that report now. I'll be sharing it with the community. I'm really excited. Uh, to see the work that they've done and the recommendations that they are making. In the next slide, you'll see that we're also engaged in uh, uh, really supporting university integrity by doing uh, a risk assessment. So our audit department, the health system, uh, we're all working together to conduct this university-wide risk assessment. So it will, this will allow us to uh, identify what risks exist within our business units so that we can mitigate those. I think this will go, this is part of really trying to rebuild trust in what we do at UNM 
So I'm really grateful for the launch of this particular assessment. And the next, um, you know, we continue to try to help our students uh, 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 with their careers. We're part of the STEM Boomerang program. Many of you are familiar with that. Um, and we partnered, STEM Boomerang partnered with New Space New Mexico to host a space and beyond virtual career fair on April 30th. And it connected a lot of STEM students to professionals um, with over a dozen companies and organizations. And this has become more and more critical now with, with this COVID pandemic, the, the, uh, the employment opportunities are uncertain for, for students in so many areas. And so we're trying to help our students in these uncertain times with thinking about where they're, um, where, what their life looks like uh, when they graduate. And then finally, I want to say thank you uh, to outgoing advisors. I think this is possibly the last meeting for folks. So Adam and Muhammad and Ryan and Alexis and, and Bev, thank you um, for, for your work and being advisors to our board, uh, advisors to the leadership of this university. Um, you're all pretty incredible. And it's been a pleasure, pleasure working with you. And with that, I will stand for questions or sit for questions. <laughs> Are there questions from the regents? Hearing none. Yes. President Stokes, I just have to. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, this was extremely um, uh, helpful. And thank you so much for this report. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for. Um, your service at this remarkable time. I can't quite imagine what it would be like to be a university president right now and over the last couple of months. It's certainly uh, is, uh, something I think nothing could prepare you for. And we are very fortunate to have you um, uh, exercising the leadership that you have at this moment. And we are really appreciative um, for that. Not just uh, your leadership, but uh, uh, Provost Holloway and the rest of the team has been uh, truly remarkable on uh, both sides of, uh, of Lomas across the campus and we're say uh, very thankful for everything that that you have done um, I'm um, a, um, I've been a little concerned by what I've been reading about campuses generally across the, the country opening up so quickly um, and it's of course been a debate that we've seen um, discussed at great length in the Chronicle of Higher Education but also in the New York Times and other um, sort of the more generally read publications um, a lot of discussion about when colleges can open up colleges and universities will start uh, returning to on-campus activities as well as online activities obviously we're open in the meantime too but we're open in a different kind of way and I was I'll say especially a little uh, especially concerned by reading the um, reopening campuses document from the higher education department in, in New Mexico which at least based on what I've seen from the data in New Mexico is um, I think it's fair to call it wildly optimistic about where we're going to be uh, on the public health side when that uh, moment comes when the fall semester um, uh, begins and I say appreciate hearing you talk about the dependence on um, scientific data, the students depending, dependence on scientific data, but also our dependence on scientific data when we decide how to handle this. <clears throat> In the end, my question is, uh, who's, whose call is it? Is it the, um, does the higher education department get to make the call on what happens on campus in the fall? Or is that the, the governor's call? Or is that the individual campuses um, a call? Is it our university that gets to make that um, Paul, do you have a sense of how that's going to work out when the, the fall comes? Because there certainly is a lot of pressure on the universities to um, have on-campus activities. And as you point out, there may be scientific reasons uh, not to have those as well. So, you know, I think that the, you know, we've actually had that conversation with uh, Stephanie Rodriguez from the governor's office during the cup, one of the cup meetings. Uh, and I think there's a clear understanding from the governor that higher education in New Mexico is run by the boards. And so uh, what we've been asked, and, and we all agree that, um, uh, that, uh, that we abide by uh, what our governor's, uh, governor is saying we need to do. And so I think everyone is on board and you see throughout my slides where this is mentioned that we will rely on those 
uh, state guidelines and Albuquerque guidelines for uh, what is best for us to do. Um, so although we have some autonomy uh, as higher education institutions accredited because we have governing boards and, uh, and we're not supposed to be controlled by, uh, by state government basically, but, um, uh, but I do think um, you know, it will be the call of individual institutions uh, 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 in making decisions about, uh, about what things will look like uh, summer, fall, and, and next academic year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions of President Stokes by Regents? So, Not a question, but just a comment. Uh, I echo what Regent Schwartz said. Uh, hats off to you, President Stokes, and the entire leadership team on campus. Um, this has been quite uh, an incredible time, and we're very um, proud of your leadership and the team's leadership. So thank you. Thank you. I do have to say I, I feel so grateful for the team that I have. Really, really exceptional people um, uh, working very hard. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we would not be so successful if I didn't have this great team around me. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I just have to chip in to Doug Brown here that uh, President Stokes, I, you know, running a university isn't easy in peacetime situations. And this is so far from that. And the way you've kept things going, and I think the positive messages that you sent with all the due, proper due cautions and the team that you've put together has performed so admirably. And I really have to give credit to Chancellor Roth and his team and, uh, and also statewide leadership with Chancellor Roth at the Navajo Nation and Mike Richards uh, helping statewide in the hospital reactions and Richard Larson, his leadership at Tricor and the way they've stepped up on testing and ever so many and Finney Coleman, you're working with the faculty so constructively and Ryan, um, we're going to miss you guys. Uh, that's uh, really, really appreciated. And of course, the students. Students are having to put up with, you know, some severe disappointments in the kind of college life that they had anticipated. And, um, you know, a Adam and Afzal, your leadership in, in keeping their spirits up and, and listening and passing on reactions is extremely helpful. Just thanks all for coping with the situation. And we all just I pray we can return to a more normal as soon as is prudent to do so. And we also, not just a student health, but of course faculty and staff is of grave concern at every step of the way. So thank you for that. Any other questions or comments from uh, Regents? Sure, Doug, this is Sandra. I just wanted to add that, you know, President Stokes and the leadership were giving us um, quite often good information of what was happening as it was taking place. So right from the ver very beginning, the communication between um, the team and, and leadership to the Board of Regents so that we know what was happening. And also um, we've heard the concerns of faculty, staff, and the students as things changed. But it really was like, like President Stokes said, a team effort that everybody cooperated. And uh, I just wanted to also add my appreciation for everybody working so hard to address the unknown. And as things change daily, people have been able to keep up and, and try to just move forward. So I appreciate the positive nature that the leadership team has taken to make sure the students, faculty, and staff are safe. And I, I just wanted to add my thank you. Thank you. Good, well, thank you. Hearing no further comments, if we may, I will go to the public comments. Now we had, a, a protocol where the public comments had to come in by noon yesterday, noon Monday, <clears throat> to be eligible to be to be heard. Well, we bent that a little bit. There were a couple of late comers within an hour or so, and given that this is an initial run through on this thing, we admitted all those comments to be heard. Uh, there was one public uh, written comment, uh, did not want to necessarily give a live comment, but it was from Justin Garcia, who's a senior reporter for the Daily Lobo. And his question is, will the regents reduce tuition and fees in the fall if UNM continues with online instructions? Why or why not? And is it the custom, uh, we don't respond 
right here, right now, to these comments and get into debate, but rather, I think during the provost's comments and vice president um, um, for enrollment um, comments, uh, we can get into, uh, we'll maybe touch upon that matter. As far as live comments, uh, we'll see if this works. We're trying to patch in um, five live comments. Uh, the first one would be from Mr. Bruce Weatherby from the Candle Public Publishing um, Group. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, to, good morning to all of the regents and to uh, President Stokes. Uh, first of all, I, I want to also thank the healthcare workers that are affiliated with the university for the hard work that they do and the dangerous work they do taking care of folks in New Mexico. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Stokes because the reason I'm calling is actually uh, about a report that, that I wrote, the journal has written about, and the journal has editorialized regarding uh, the situation with the contract uh, and a release of claims by uh, Steve McKernan, a uh, contract he has with the University Hospital for which he basically does no work and receives $150,000 a year. Um, I've communicated to the Board of Regents uh, through your the channels that you have. Dr. Stokes is the only one who's really provided uh, a response of any significance. Uh, uh, Chancellor Roth has just avoided any questions. Uh, CEO Becker has avoided questions regarding this. Um, I don't expect that you are going to provide answers today. I understand what uh, the chair just said about not responding to questions. So what I did want to let you know is we're preparing our final investigative report which will come out in the next two weeks about this. I assume the Board of Regents is aware that the documents relative to the release of claims has gone missing, signed document. Um, I've done, I've waited patiently for three months for a response and got, well, we know it's been signed, but uh, we can't find it. Uh, that's really unacceptable. And I think the Board of Regents who, in their oversight responsibilities needs to tighten up on that. If we can't get a response within the next 10 days before we issue our final report, we're gonna provide the information that we have received from, uh, from obviously the efforts we've, we've uh, requested and received response from and other sources that, uh, that we have received information of to the appropriate authorities that do investigation of uh, a more serious nature than what a newspaper can do. Uh, so hopefully somebody can get back to us. Uh, with that, um, I do want to thank the people who work very hard there. I know how hard it is. It's kind of unfortunate uh, that a person who uh, the hospital and the university celebrated as a CEO there for many, many years was deemed apparently not capable of doing the job that he was hired to do. And even though he's, he has said he wanted to do it, uh, they are deciding to pay him for more than two and a half years to do nothing, especially when there are also people, some of those healthcare workers are receiving barely uh, living wage or less than living wage while they are on the front lines. So that's basically my comment. Hopefully you get back. Thank you, Mr. Weatherby. The next comment is from um, Professor of the Law Library Ship, uh, librarianship, uh, Ernesto Longa. Mr. Longa? Good morning, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to make a public comment. <clears throat> In October of 2019, UNM faculty registered their disillusion with the university policies, shared governance bodies, and the terms and conditions of their employment by voting overwhelmingly in favor of unionization. A week after the union election, President Stokes reported to the Faculty Senate that she was, quote, optimistic about what we may be able to, together, to do together in crafting a collective bargaining agreement that serves UNM and its faculty. Then on January 15th, 2020, Provost Holloway stated, quote, 
My hope is that we will be able to quickly and collaboratively establish the first collective bargaining agreement between UNM and UAUNM before this summer. Unfortunately, after five months of negotiations, it is clear that the administration's private actions are diametrically opposed to their public statements. Five months ago, the administration presented UAUNM with an initial contract proposal so regressive that, if signed, would have resulted in a worsening of our members' terms and conditions of employment. Five months into negotiations, we are still waiting for a proposal or counterproposal from the administration that is neither boilerplate, superficial, or condescending. Five months into negotiations, we have yet to reach a tentative agreement on a single contract article. Case in point, the administration responded to our recent proposal on academic freedom by stating that the subject of academic freedom did not need to be addressed in our collective bargaining agreement. In fact, the subject of academic freedom is a subject addressed in every faculty collective bargaining agreement we have looked at. Five months into negotiations, UAUNM remains committed to negotiating in good faith for a fair collective bargaining agreement. UAUNM encourages the administration to roll up their sleeves, do their share of work and negotiations, and sincerely collaborate with us as equal partners in the drafting of a collective bargaining agreement that will improve our university. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Professor Longa. Uh, next, we have uh, Matthias Fontenla, if I'm saying that right. Correct, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. This is Matthias Fontenla, Social Professor of Economics, main campus. I commend everybody in our global community for their hard work and doing their best in these extremely challenging times. I was watching President Stokes just now uh, showing us very sobering numbers, mentioning the uncertainty and that we're all waiting for the legislature to revisit budgets and asking us, us all to show innovation and commit, commitment to our mission. Um, we expect some very hard decisions will have to be made that will affect the entire UNM community. In this light, I just wanted to remind you that UNM faculty overwhelmingly voted to have a faculty union to give us a voice in situations like this after years of being ignored. And thus, in order to save you some time before you come talk to us, I have some suggestions. One example, is really athletics part of the best education we can provide? Is that part of our core mission? It seems that our core mission is to educate, to develop minds. But rather than develop minds, football seems to be destroying the brains of our students. And may I remind you, at a loss of millions of dollars, that could instead maybe provide better health care and support to our struggling students. Don't get me wrong. I love football, but very tough decisions will have to be made and we need to be <clears throat> innovative. Um, we also love soccer um, and New Mexicans are proving it and their wonderful support of New Mexico United, but you cut soccer, so you can do the same with football. Also, one more example, you're paying lots of money to outside counsel to stall us in the bargaining table where our only objective seems to be maximizing billable hours. Maybe you should do what is best for UNM and its faculty and start bargaining in good faith. And here's a question for you. Healthcare premiums for faculty and staff are scheduled to go up by 4.9% on July 1st uh, for all faculty and staff at UNM. I thought this was a mandatory subject of bargaining that you just can't increase our healthcare premiums without sitting down to talk to us. Um, here's the thought provide affordable health care to all of our students, staff, and faculty instead of spending millions of dollars to destroy the brains of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Up next, uh, Billy Brown. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm William Brown, PhD in mathematics, part-time temporary that is part-time temporary instructor in mathematics and statistics for the nearly 15 years. Uh, 
I bring you greetings from the trenches of online instruction. Uh, my 31 statistics students yesterday <clears throat> took their online exam, and I'm uh, spending most of today and tomorrow going through their exams, uh, making sure they're getting appropriate credit for the work that they did. <clears throat> I am a strong supporter of my faculty union, United Academics at UNM. Uh, I have two concerns I want to express today. Well, first, I want to just wish everyone good health and safety uh, to, to all of you personally and to all of your loved ones. Uh, we, are <laughs> we are bunkered down in our home and staying healthy. Uh, my two concerns are, up to this moment, adjuncts and, and part-time instructors at UNM are virtually completely excluded from all faculty governance bodies at UNM, including the Faculty Senate, uh, most department meetings, and we are not allowed to vote. Uh, we are not part of the voting faculty. I urge the university administration to uh, to bargain with the union to provide uh, of a voice in the governance of the University of New Mexico to those of us like myself who have been working very hard for many years, but uh, at reduced pay and and reduced uh, opportunity to participate. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is I know the financial conditions are 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 difficult at this time, but I certainly hope that. <clears throat> that will not be used to deny what seems to me obvious that adjunct and part-time instructors in the branch campuses, members of the bargaining unit too, have been, uh, you know, have been denied living wages and have had essentially no raises, most of them, for nearly 10 years. I certainly hope that in the budgetary considerations going forward, that at least we'll be able to bring those individuals, my colleagues, uh, s slaving away in the branch campuses at less than living wages, to bring them up significantly in their pay. Uh, personally, I'm willing to sacrifice my own raise, if there are any, to help them uh, get bootstrapped. And I hope that some of the administrators might be willing to kick in some of, uh, some of their pay to help those people. Thank you very much. Fine. Thank, thank you, Billy. And thank you for all, all the things you do to support UNM. Uh, the final commenter we have is uh, Jessamine Lovell. Hello, uh, I'm Jessamine Lovell. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I am a lecturer, uh, contingent faculty in the College of Fine Arts, um, lecturer, a senior lecturer, and the undergraduate director in the art department. Um, I have worked at UNM proudly for 10 years now in various capacities, including being adjunct um, several times, visiting professor, um, as well as lecturer of different stages. Um, and I wanted to echo my colleagues um, in, in our union, our faculty union, UA UNM, um, as an activist in the union, in our union, I wanted to echo what they were all saying, especially what Billy Brown was speaking to around um, the adjunct, the, mm -hmm. um, the, the disparity in um, pay that they experience in treatment, um, especially as budgets are cut, we're relying more and more. Um, departments are forced to rely on adjunct and grad um, labor. Uh, and I see educators as essential workers. And as that um, continues to be prioritized in our future, if we, if we continue to prioritize educators, um, then we are going to need to pay them a living wage, pay them better, and, um, and provide them with health care. They deserve um, to be well and safe. Um, I also uh, actually, uh, in light of the recent hate crimes that have been the ongoing hate crimes over the last couple of weeks, um, I, I was waiting for President Stokes to mention that, and she did when she mentioned the town hall. Um, it was kind of buried in there. Uh, to me, as a strong advocate of Black Lives Matter movement and of my colleagues and community members who are Black, uh, I think it's really important that this be front and center um, for students, for faculty who are being threatened. Um, as, I've, as I said, they've been ongoing. The most recent threats have come this earlier this week. 
Um, and I think that those details need to be um, publicly available. And I understand there's an ongoing investigation. Um, and in light of the violence and hatred against Black people in our country right now, uh, most recently, um, uh, very public and um, uh, uh, discussed on social media, Maude Arbery, um, one of many Black men shot randomly, um, found and tortured, uh, um, and then displayed on video. Um, so I really am in fear of my co for my colleagues who are Black, who are being threatened, and as uh, someone who um, has the privilege of being white and doesn't have to experience this, I think it's important that we all um, as colleagues come together to help support these folks and give them the information. I actually have some colleagues who were in Africana studies um, working recently that didn't know, they didn't even know that um, their lives had been threatened, that their colleagues' lives had been threatened. This is a life or death situation. I understand the president is very focused on COVID-19. I'm very grateful for her leadership in that. And this is also a crisis um, and sadly, uh, these are multiple crises overlapping over time. So I would urge the president to take stronger action in and communicating with our public, at least the UNM community, on what steps are being taken in this investigation to find the folks who are making these threats. Um, I understand the FBI is involved. What, what are these reports that are coming? I will be participating in the town hall tonight. I hope my colleagues uh, listening to this will also participate. I think it's a really important life or death situation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lovell. At this point, uh, I, I wish to thank the uh, IT staff, Dwayne and, and Dean and the group. I, I think this public comment period uh, went on very well logistically, and I hope it was uh, audible to all, but I, I thank you for arranging that. That went much smoother than I, I would have anticipated. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we uh, want to move to the approval of the main campus HSC and branch campuses uh, 2021 budgets. Oh, there's comments from the regions and I have a comment. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Okay, there are comments. Excuse me. I, we had earlier comments, but yes, by all means. Um, and, and this, I, I know everybody has read the uh, Daily Lobo report about the seal and I know it's not on our agenda today. I would just like to caution the Board of Regents. This, the seal has been something that since 2016, um, we've had many people come before us and talk to us about their concerns over the seal. And my concern is, um, is twofold. As I said, in 2016, I brought up the fact that we needed to have more input from the constituencies at UNM and that the process needed to be very inclusive. Um, as you all know, the seal is mostly visible on our diplomas. So they're the property of the university, but also the property of the students that proudly display them mm -hmm. after they have earned them. And the seal generally is used during our pomp and circumstance. Um, it's not our commercial mark. It's not what we sell our uh, um, license plates or our bumper stickers or our t-shirts. The seal really is something that is very specific uh, to commencement and our official, every official document that, that is around academia. And that being said, I was a little concerned that um, the process uh, was, um, during Azar it seemed, and I wasn't there, and, I, and I, I've had certain people contact me and they were very upset about it, that the regents interceded and overrode the process that had been uh, working since 2016. So I know that that's something that's gonna come up later. I just would like to say that we honor the process. Uh, we, we listen to the input of the people who uh, will have these on their diplomas and who have taken on this task. And that's my only comment, thank you. Uh, Re Re Regent Sanchez Real or, uh, or, or Henry as chair of ASAR, uh, do you wish to make any comment at this point? Um, no, not at this point. I'm looking forward to the, <clears throat> the revised uh, seal um, coming back to ASAR and then bringing it to the full board. So thanks for your comments, Maron. Good. All right. Thank you. Are there thanks. other regions' comments at this point? Doug, I would like to make a comment. Yes. 
Do you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I, I also wanted to thank some of the outgoing advisors, but specifically I wanted to take a moment to thank our student advisors. Um, they're, I think, I don't know about Muhammad, but I know that Adam is graduating. He's our ASUNM president. Um, and I'm just really proud of some of the work that both of them have done. I know that uh, this is probably one of the most difficult years being a student leader at UNM with everything that's been going on. I think that they've done an excellent job. So I just wanted to comment and say that they're gonna be missed and I thank them for all the service that they've been, they've contributed to the university and how they've been a part of the board for the last year. So thank you so much, Muhammad and Adam. Thank you. Are there other region, region comments? Yes. Sure, Doug, this is Sandra, real, real briefly. Add my thanks to those who have been mentioned. Um, I did also wanna give a, a thank you to Al Alexis, who has led the UNM Alumni Association. I enjoyed reading about the Clean Pause initiative of getting hand sanitizers out to different parts of um, New Mexico, not just Albuquerque, and wonderful donation of uh, homemade or local made um, hand sanitizer. And then the others to all those who put out public um, PSAs, public service announcements about how to wash your hands, how important that is, and how to keep yourself healthy. So there was various parts of UNM through media relations and athletics and also HSC. Very good public service announcements. I wanted to thank you personally. Thank you. Thank you. Other regions? Hearing none, let us move to the approval of the uh, budgets as I described. And um, uh, Teresa Constantinidis, so you're gonna take this forward? I will take this forward. Um, this is Teresa Costantinidis, Senior Vice President for Finance and Administration, and I am here today, President Brown, President Stokes, and all the members of the Board of Regents to present to you for your approval the fiscal year 2020-21 operating and capital plans for the University of New Mexico. Joining me today making this presentation are Chancellor Paul Roth from the HSC, Executive Officer for Finance Administration, Ava Lovell, also from the HSC, and the Director for University Budget Operations, Norma Allen. The budget that we are presenting to you today is based upon the New Mexico state budget that was approved by the governor in March and includes the budget assumptions for tuition and compensation that were approved by the Board of Regents also in March. The only change from those assumptions reflected in this is a lowering of student fees. When the Board of Regents approved the budget we back in March, we anticipated an increase in mandatory student fees from $20 per student to $25 per student. The election took place after the March Board of Regents meeting and that increase was not approved by the students. And therefore that increase is not reflected in this budget. Now with the significant impact of COVID-19 and the unexpected drop in oil prices, we expect a special session, as the President mentioned, of the New Mexico Legislature to convene as early as June 2020. And that special session, we expect to have significant negative implications on the budget that we are presenting to you today. We have been working with the CUP, the Council of University Presidents, on scenarios, numerous scenarios that include state budget cuts of up to 15% or about $53 million for UNM. So as a result, our financial planning teams have been working on ways to absorb these cuts and mitigate the impacts to our academic healthcare and research missions of the university. So we fully acknowledge that the budget request we are submitting to you today for your approval is likely not going to be the budget we will finalize for fiscal year 2020, given the economic circumstances we have described, particularly with regard to employee compensation. It would not be fiscally prudent to allocate any increase in compensation that is greater than the funding that the state ultimately provides for such purposes. However, we must submit our budget request in accordance with House Bill 2 from March, as currently written, unless and until the legislature modifies the legislation. So with this request, we're asking you to allow the UNM administration to make any necessary changes to this fiscal year 2021 budget based on the outcomes of the future special session. In turn, we plan to return to you as soon as it's practicable for approval of a revised fiscal year 21 budget augmentation request or called the BAR. 
So what we expect to happen is we will submit this budget, there will be changes, and then the state will ask us to submit a new budget adjustment request, which requires through gentle approval. So now I'll provide summary information about the main campus and branch campus budgets, and then Chancellor Roth and Senior Executive Officer Lovell will provide information about the HSC budget. There's far more detail in the fiscal year 2021 operating and capital budget that you receive. So starting with this slide, the total consolidated 2021 budget for the University of New Mexico is $3.32 billion, which is an increase in the scenario of 4.9% from fiscal year 20. The largest increase is in the UNM Health Sciences Center, increasing 5.9%, followed by the main campus at 2.4%. The branch campuses will show to increase at 1.7%. In the next slide, when looking at the total revenues for the main campus, note that a quarter of our budget comes from state appropriation, and then 20% each comes from tuition and fees and spon our sponsored activity, almost 18%. It's the funds we generate by our auxiliary services, such as housing, dining, parking, and other non-student instruction. Um, and for the 2021 year, we plan to use fund balances to play, pay for 12.4% of our activities. The next slide shows that in looking at how we spend our money, our largest two expenditures are instruction and capital, making up well over half of our operations. Student aid and research comes in next, and finally, public service and auxiliary activities. In slide seven, as I mentioned earlier, the budget includes an increase in state appropriation. A tuition approved in March, less that $5 ASU and M increase, and then the planned 4% compensation increase. Slide eight shows that on our branch campuses, so this is Gallup, Los Alamos, Taos, and Valencia all combined, they're funded 42% from the state and 19% from grants and contracts, 17% from local governments in the blue there, and 13% in yellow from tuition and fees. Slide nine shows the expenditures for the branches, and the bulk of their expenditures are, as you would expect, instruction in general, with 13% public service. Now, we have seen a slight decrease in research activity at the branch campus, and I say slight. This year, the budget is, and then you can go to the next slide, the budget is 1.7 million or 3.3%, and last year, the total was 1.97 million and 3.8%, so it's pretty a pretty small change. So with that overview, I'm now going to turn it over to Paul Roth and Ava Lovell to talk about the HSC budget. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, just a couple of general uh, comments, and then I'll turn it over to Ava. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, these numbers were generated around May the 1st, and subsequent to May the 1st, there's been a lot of changes that affect the Health Sciences Center. So the budget that you're about to approve, the numbers uh, I can definitively say are, are wrong. Uh, they're not gonna be the same numbers uh, that eventually we uh, will uh, be operating under. Uh, I do wanna say that uh, we're very, very grateful to the uh, CMS and the state of New Mexico for both the stimulus funds and uh, this significant uh, albeit temporary increase in, uh, uh, in Medicaid funding that will significantly help our hospitals. Um, because of these re uh, new revenues and some very aggressive expense management on the part of our CEOs in the health system, I would suspect that our health system numbers are going to be uh, significantly better than what uh, you'll be seeing uh, in this presentation. Uh, and we've been able to do that uh, without any kinds of furloughs or layoffs, as has been the case in many other hospitals in the state of New Mexico. And I would just like to mention that uh, the uh, smaller hospitals, the rural hospitals in New Mexico are in a, a huge crisis. Um, and uh, whatever relief uh, these additional funds will uh, give them could 
prevent them from closing their doors. So it's, it's very important for the entire uh, health system in the state of New Mexico. But on the uh, academic side of the Health Sciences Center, we will be affected by any uh, state cuts in appropriations. Uh, we are uh, dependent on the state for about 14% of our operating budget. And so any reductions there will, will have an impact on our clinical faculty as well as our educational and uh, research faculty. Uh, and so with those uh, overarching comments, I'd like to turn it over to Ava. Thank you. And I do appreciate um, the ability to uh, present to the regents and the president today. So let's just go right ahead to the next slide. So this is the overall entire health science center. So at the health science center, we do include our two um, healthcare component units, and that is the um, SRMC and the UNM Medical Group, because we are such an integrated health science center that uh, we really can't uh, exclude any of our units. So the overall budget for the Health Science Center, the entire Health Science Center is 2.4 billion, which is a 7.1% increase over the original budget for 2020. So starting uh, on this slide then, and looking uh, at starting at 12 o'clock, you can see that the, all the mill levy, we get mill levy at both UNM Hospital and SRMC is about $117 million. Uh, going clockwise then around to uh, all of our state revenues, which would include all the RPSPs and the cigarette tax and the tobacco settlement are all at 117, uh, 117 million. Tuition and fees for us at 30 million is just 1%. Um, our contracts and grants um, are right at 156 million. Again, um, we have a lot, some other revenue and transfers and so forth. Um, as we keep going around, you'll see that commercial insurance is about 18%. And this combines all of the hospitals and the physician billings. Uh, Medicare at about 14%. You can see that Medicaid really is quite large at 24%. And that other patient care revenue is things like self-pay and IHS, and also includes the uh, patient care revenue that we do transfer and, and pay back and forth uh, between the hospital mainly and the School of Medicine. Next slide. The next slide here shows our expenditure budget for also FY21 at 2.4 billion. And it, it, this slide really is just to show you the size of our particular unit. So starting at 12 o'clock at the top, School of Medicine almost uh, is a little more than 25% of the total health science center. Um, nursing at 16 million, pharmacy 23 million, population health 6 million, our, all of our uh, administration for research and general administration, including all of our utilities, um, groundskeeping, everything is 90 million or 3.82%. See that UNM Hospital, our largest unit at 1.2 billion is 53%. Sandoval Regional Medical Center, uh, 94 million in, in their expenditures and UNM Medical Group at seven, 274 million. Next slide. On this slide, we'll just start looking at the uh, a comparative analysis for just the academic enterprise. Again, all the schools, colleges, administration, and research. The original 2020 budget was one uh, had a mar net margin of 1.5 million. We re revised that budget for 2020 to give us a 3.2 million dollar um, bottom line, and our 2021 budget. Uh, at only 324,000. And really that reflects the amount of uh, unfunded increase for the 4% raise, compensation raise across uh, the Health Science Center, uh, which really does uh, focus on our School of Medicine faculty and the amount of, uh, very small amount of state money that goes into that raise. 
the um, revenue for the academic side does show the 2.6% uh, base tuition increase for all programs and has the House Bill 2 um, 9.7% increase in state funding in that. Although as, as we've discussed before, we feel like that um, may go away in a special session. And indeed the 4% will likely go away as well. Next slide. So for the academic enterprise, just breaking down so that you can see the net margin of each of the units at the Health Science Center, the School of Medicine and College of Nursing have budgeted a, a zero net margin for next year. Again, kind of really trying to uh, cover all of the um, salary increases that we've budgeted. College of Pharmacy will use a little bit of their balance as well as the Co College of Population Health. Those use of balances are for non-recurring items and they do have the um, reserves to cover that. Research and general administration will um, generate a little more revenue than, than expense and have a million dollar net margin. Overall, the total academic health science center net margin at 324,000. Next slide. We'll go to UNM Hospital. Again, this is just a comparative analysis showing the original uh, 2020 budget was had a margin of 4.4 million. The revised 2020 budget um, has a net margin of 26 million, but we need to realize that 33 million of that is state funding that came in for the hospital tower and for the Center for Movement Disorder. Without that capital funding, um, they have revised their budget to a loss of $7 million. And again, they put some uh, um, losses in there because of the uh, COVID-19 and their uh, stopping a lot of the uh, scheduled surgeries uh, that happened in the middle of March. Um, they have budgeted for uh, 2020 a, a net margin of 30 million. Um, as we move on, we'll see how that changes. Things have gone up and down since we did this budget. And uh, we're, as Dr. Ross said, we are looking though, uh, hopefully at being in the black for 21 in the budget we end up with. Next slide. This is UNM Medical Group, which is our faculty practice and the faculty billing arm uh, of the Health Science Center. So uh, the comparative analysis again, showing you the FY20 original budget of 4.9 million net margin and the revised net margin of 8.2 million negative. And really this is not, uh, not mostly COVID related. This has to do with a large amount of actual revenue that we booked at the end of 2019. And so we had a $15 million net margin, actual net margin for the end of 2019. We are now spending that in 20. So it's really a timing issue and does not represent a recurring loss. The, the uh, medical group has budgeted back up to their 7.9 million positive for FY21. Next slide. Sandoval Regional Medical Center, our small community hospital, um, uh, their comparative analysis showing that for the original budget of FY20, they had a $28,000 uh, net margin, really break even. They are a break even um, operation. Uh, being as small as they are, every change makes a big difference to them. Um, they re their revised budget is essentially unchanged for 2020. And for FY21, again, they budgeted basically um, a break even. Next slide. So this just rolls up the health system, the three units of the health system showing a $38.3 million net margin um, in that far right column for the budget for 21. Next slide. Just adding the academic enterprise into the health system for a total uh, Health Science Center 2021 budget of about $2.4 billion and a net margin of $38,620,000. And with that, I will stand for questions. Are there questions? 
Yeah. Um, are these on, on both um, for the full budget um, uh, report? Uh, on what? On both sides of um, uh, the, the Health Sciences Center and the, um, the rest of the university? Is that motion to be for well, approval? To I, I have some questions and I was just wondering- well, You can ask, ask away. Okay, great. Thanks. I mean, and my concern with the budget report. This is uh, this is uh, Regent uh, Schwartz. Sorry, this is Rob Schwartz speaking. Um, uh, and let me just. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't identify myself. Um, uh, and let me just uh, point out that this. I mean, this is obviously um, a helpful budget um, a report, but it is pretty far from what the actual budget is going to look like. And as you pointed out, um, I mean, it's it's helpful in some ways, but it may be really misleading in other ways. Uh, we're going to have a new budget. It's going to be a very different budget. It's going to go into effect very soon. I mean, really, the budget goes into effect in six weeks, the new budget, this budget that we're talking about now. And um, I'm sure that you've been thinking about what the real budget is going to look like, not just what the this placeholder budget is going to look like. And I'm sure that the BLT and others and the, the Health Sciences Center have been working on what that actual budget will be like. And we, we know something about what's going to happen. We know that the state budget has gone from uh, very good when the budget was actually passed to very bad today. The out, certainly the outlook has gone from very good to very bad in revenue terms. Um, can you give us a hint, some, some ideas about where we're going on this budget? I mean, what's, how are the cuts going to be made? Because we're assuming that there are going to be substantial cuts to this budget for the next year. And uh, for example, on the, um, uh, the general academic side or the uh, health sciences academic side, either one, is the idea to, are you thinking about across the board cuts? Are you thinking about um, uh, just um, uh, salary based um, uh, cuts for uh, faculty and staff? Or are you thinking about uh, cutting particular departments and uh, targeted cuts at particular programs? I mean, we really don't have very much time to uh, make those decisions, or we won't when we have to come up with our new budget. We're going to have very little time uh, to make those decisions, and it would probably be helpful for us to know now where we're going and where, where the university thinks that it'll be going when it has to institute these cuts. Uh, I'm wondering if, if there's more information on that. If I may direct that to... Uh, to uh, Senior Vice President Constantinidis, uh, and I think she indicated that this is a budget that was required to be in by May 15th based on the allocations made by the legislature in their last session, and that we indeed are looking at budget scenarios. But Teresa, would you like to talk a touch about more about the process you intend to follow once we know the true parameters from the state? Yes, thank you so much, Regent Brown. So, um, Regent Schwartz, I'm, um, thank you for a great question, and it is what the, we've been working on as an institution in an environment of great uncertainty, because we do not know the extent to which, to which the changes might happen. Um, we're looking at reductions that include the elimination of the compensation increase, additional reductions of up to 15%, or we're working with CUP on those scenarios, and um, just as a reminder, the process by which we impl implemented the budget reductions that we built in to the base budget. So we, as a reminder, we had to implement cuts of about 3.6 to 3.7%. We did not do across the board reductions for that. And uh, our expectation is that with the additional reductions that may be coming, we will continue the same process, gathering input from the budget leadership team and looking at where the, there are resources. We have already begun cost saving measures at UNM. So as you know, um, may have heard, we have a hiring freeze or hiring pause in place. We have actually put a pause on certain HR um, activities that would have additional costs for the campus. And we are about to announce additional cost cons um, constraining efforts on the campus. Um, in the next couple of days. HSC went ahead and, um, and sent out messages related to travel costs and um, what I refer to as entertainment, but as food costs for meetings, those types of things. So we're moving forward on the ways to reduce resources and sending a call out to all of our people on the campus to be as conservative as possible with spending money. So we, we know this is coming. We don't know how big it is. Um, just 
you know, the, the increase on the compensation, that's a $9.5 million piece right there for the main campus alone, doesn't include HSC. There's a lot of parts that we're looking at. Can I just, yeah. excuse me, I was gonna ask Chancellor Roth to comment also if there's further elaboration. No, I think Teresa uh, identified uh, the main approach for the Health Sciences Center. Our revenue streams are very, very different as everyone knows from the rest of the university. And as I commented, I think, I am hoping that we will be in a stable um, fiscal situation for our health system. Um, as, uh, as Ava reviewed the, the state funding though, if there were a 15% uh, percent cut in state funding, that would be about a $13.5 million reduction. Um, we would, uh, we would continue our current measures of freezing positions, which we believe will make up a large portion of that. And, um, and very likely use some reserves to carry us through the balance of the year. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Regent Schwartz, do you have a follow on question? Yeah, I do. Thank you very much. And I, I re appreciate the, um, the comments and the answers. And I realize that there are uncertainties that it's really hard to overcome. Um, and I, I can see on the health sciences side that the um, at least dramatic if temporary um, uh, Medicaid increase and, and um, the benefit of, of the CARES Act may in fact um, substantially ameliorate the loss there. But it's going to be much harder to absorb, it seems, um, in the rest of the campus. And so I think my, my question is for, um, and I think my question may have been answered by uh, Vice President Constantinidis, but you're suggesting that really what we're doing is trying to figure out places we can save money, basically the hiring pause, the travel limitations, food limitations, sort of minor things. And then what we have left, the really big <clears throat> hit seems to be compensation of faculty and staff. That's where our, we have some, some more leeway and where you're suggesting the, the cuts um, necessarily are going to fall. And, I mean, I, I guess I just wanted to focus in on that and see if that's right. <clears throat> and then to ask what, what you're, I mean, I realize you can't know exactly how big the cuts are gonna be, but we have a sense of what the, the state budget looks like. Um, now or we're beginning to get a sense of what the state budget looks like. When, when you said elimination of compensation increase, do you mean, there's a reasonable chance that all of that that four percent would be eliminated and that there'd be an additional cut beyond that or i mean i didn't quite understand what what you were saying you talked about the elimination of compensation and an additional decrease of 15 percent that that's that is, that is actually yeah sorry i interrupted yes that is exactly right we are looking at a range so the the compensation could be um increase of four percent that's built into that march budget yeah could be cut in half, it could be completely eliminated. We're looking at all of that. In addition, we are looking at additional reductions in our base allocation up, you know, so we looked at 1%, 5%, 10%, 15%. So we're looking at different scenarios to get an understanding of what that might be in addition. So what we are also thinking about is um, when you saw the chart that the president gave, um, as we move forward, things could be a lot harder in fiscal year 21-22 than they could be in fiscal year 2021, because um, for 2021 at least, there is one-time reserves, both at the state and at the um, campus level. And we, as you saw in the budget, we are planning just in the base budget to spend down our reserves. We'll have to do even more in order to make it through. So there, the, the range of reduction could be quite large and harder two years out. And we're not going to be able to handle those through just a hiring freeze. Oh, no. The hiring freeze, the um, pause on things like travel, those types of things are short-term small items. We will have to do something bigger and more significant, depending on the scope of what, what we expect the amounts will be. Um, those, it's getting started now, letting people have a sense of how big this reduction might be for UNM. 
I think is what we're trying to yep. do without right. uh, announcing a number when we don't know what that number might be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, I think I would prefer not to do a lot of speculation at this point until we see guidance from the state. It, it, it simply could be alarming and uh, in fact, the scenarios might not be quite as dire as the worst case we look at. Other questions by other regions or comments? Yes, uh, Chair Brown, this is Marin Lee. Yes. I, and I know th these are placeholders and they're required under law and statute. But, you know, I think that during this time, we have to look at every aspect of our business operations on campus and we need to streamline. Um, we need to deal with these financial challenges. I mean, with that being said, I mean, we did a hard job three years ago with uh, cutting sports at UNM um, and making that Title IX adjustment. And I think, um, I know the budget leadership team will do this, and I think we need to look at all aspects of our campus. I mean, from institutes that have faculty in foreign countries to every programming we have that we, at this point, are going to have to start those discussions about making those hard calls. Uh, so thank you. That's all I have to say. Well, that excellent comment. And um, <clears throat> recently, I think it's really important not to follow some absolutely across the board treatment, but rather look at programs as well as uh, expense categories. And, and Regent Brown, I agree. I mean, we, you know, everybody has their sacred <clears throat> cows. And we were, we've been, we were criticized today for cutting soccer. These, these are hard decisions. They're not easy decisions. And I think that, that BLT um, across the campus, both sides of Lomas, we need to start looking at programming. Um, I recall when I first became a regent, UNM was proud that they were all things for all people. And I just don't know if that is something that we can maintain in this financial crisis. Fine. Thank you, Thank Regent Lee. Uh, Regent uh, other Regent comments? Yes, Regent Brown, uh, I had a question here, and this is pretty basic going to just where we are in this process. And my question is, is if we all agree that this proposed budget is not anything near to what it is, why are we proceeding today with it? I mean, have we asked HED um, if we can have an extension on, on even providing a budget due to the you know, that, that we know that a special legislative session's coming up. I guess that's my question is, is yes. why are we approving this budget today when we know that it's not a real budget? Good question. Comments from uh, Teresa? Yes. We made re requests, put it off or what? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Regent Doty. Um, we requested to put it off um, and the instruction was to go ahead and send it with the understanding that it is unlikely to reflect what the actual budget will ultimately be. We were given um, an extra two weeks. So this is by um, statute required on May 1st and it was extended to May 15th, but the understanding is that um, we need to turn it in because that's what the statute says. And then what we've been told is that we will receive a request for what we call the bar, a budget adjustment request to this budget based upon what happens in a June special session. Okay, and the request for us to go ahead and turn this budget in now is coming from whom? From the higher education department. Okay, and, and the higher education department, have they told us go ahead and proceed with the budget that we've already been working on? Or have they said to give us a budget that's realistic? They want this budget that they know or they suspect will not be a realistic and they expect us to be working on another budget once we get the changed instructions from the state in mid-June. Or we okay. expect it to be in mid-June. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, other regions? Questions or comments? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, at this point now, uh, the, the motion to approve this budget for submission, is this to incorporate the budget adjustment request, the bar as well, or do you want to make that a separate motion? So what we would like to do is to request approval of this fiscal year 2021 budget with giving permission to the UNM administration to make any necessary changes to it based on the outcomes of the future legislative session and that we will then bring that 
in the form of a budget adjustment request to the regents for approval again. So. Okay. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved, Mrs. Sandra. Okay, thank Melissa you. Melissa Henry seconds. Second. Uh, further comments or questions? Yes, I have, I have a- Hearing none. Oh, excuse have, me, Rob, Rob. Yeah, I, this is Rob Schwartz. I, have, I just have a question. I'm, it's unclear to me to what extent we are approving a budget not knowing what the budget is. Um, am I correct that any, that the final budget, any final budget will come back before the regents and will be approved in the, by the regents in the future? We're authorizing correct. the current correct. administration to do the, to basically to deal with the bar and produce a bar, but the, the bar is merely temporary and a recommendation until we have a chance to actually approve it. Yes. Well, hold on a second. We're approving this budget that we yeah. will turn in and we're letting the regents know that we are going to come back to you with changes and produce something called a bar that we will then turn in yes. as a secondary budget down the line. But, the, but we are going to have to approve the bar before you turn right. it in. Right? Yes, we don't, we don't submit bars without getting the regents approval first. And in right. fact, you're going to see in a couple minutes the bar for last year that right. we need to get right. the regents approval for. Right, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you all. Hearing Can no further. One minute, Brown. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sure. So, what their state is asking for, they gave us an extension, is they need a baseline. Is unrealistic or whatever it may be at this point, they need right. a baseline. The next process in the step and steps we have to go through is allow the legislature to have their special session that has impact on us. We can only do that after the session when we have more facts. So putting in something now with the unknowns is really unrealistic. At least you have a baseline that we will have to modify. And we know we have to modify. Correct. Okay. Question no um, Yes, Kim. Uh, Teresa, what is the expected timeline for us to review that bar? Because I know, you know, traditionally bars are done as we're about to do the one for this year, right? Kind of late. It's a little cleanup process as opposed to this is going to be a bar that is really the actual budget process. So how do you, what's the timeline that you expect um, for us to see that? We are expecting once we get the um, indications from the special session, typically what happens is we're given two to four weeks, and I'm really hoping for the four weeks, to produce the revised bar. Then we will also have to do another bar in this time next year. But what we're talking about right now is a bar for 2021 that will happen presumably two to four weeks after the special session ends. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Regent President Brown, I had one more question. Sure, Ron. So this budget here, is this also, are we approving the tuition issues or we are approving tuition? The tuition sure. was approved in March and that tuition that is approved in March is showing up in this budget. Okay, so then when we get more clarification, I mean, are we gonna, is there, uh, you know, because the question that was asked earlier, if we're, you know, only offering online classes and such, are we gonna be able to go back in and look at what the tuition is gonna be for next year, or is this locking tuition for the entire uh, 2021 fiscal year? Uh, this is this is Doug. I'll take that. I think there is <clears throat> we have the authority to make changes. However, in many respects, online courses cost more to deliver than in person. So uh, that that's a qu other comments from administration on this. Sure, I'm I'm glad to jump in on this. I think you know we of course haven't made any decisions one way or the other about what. Uh, um, uh, tuition uh, might be in the longer run, but it doesn't, uh, it's not really something that we're looking at changing now. Our costs for delivering education uh, haven't gone down with the move to uh, uh, more remote classes. We're delivering excellent educational experiences uh, online and through distance technologies. Um, the, uh, the primary cost of, of those is in fact um, personnel, uh, and we're not doing things like increasing the number of students in a section uh, because that would uh, harm the uh, the educational experience that uh, those remote courses provide and so we think it's uh, probably going to be better to 
focus on the quality of our educational experiences um, and not uh, grow the size of those online sections uh, uh, to ones where you know you you can try and use scale to drive those costs down, but you really have challenges around quality. And remember, what our students are already telling us is they want high interaction. They need high interaction. That's the learning experiences that they use to grow and develop. And particularly for our student populations, low-income students, minority students, first-generation students, that ability to interact with faculty in a very close way, be it in person or be it through distance technologies, is really important. So we don't see our costs going down. Uh, with a move to uh, uh, excellent remote instruction. Uh, uh, and, and so I wouldn't at this point advocate for a, a lowering or a change of tuition based on uh, uh, doing more online instruction or not. Okay, I appreciate that clarification. I didn't thank realize you. that, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? I then move the question. Uh, all those in favor of, of the Proposals, uh, please say aye, aye. Uh, one at a time. Rob, starting with you, you're on screen. Rob, Rob me. Rob, do you, uh, yes, aye. Yes, okay. Um, Marin Lee. Aye. Sandra Begay. Aye. Kim sanchez Real. Aye. Rob Schwartz. Aye. Melissa Henry. Aye. And myself, aye. And the motion passes. And thank you for a very helpful explanation, um, Paul and Ava and, and Teresa. Uh, the next item is approval of the consent docket. Now, um, uh, actually, Regent Brown, we have one more item, and that is the fiscal year 20 bar. Oh, okay. So the, okay, want to put that on there. Okay, let's do that. Okay, thank you very Wait. much. So we're now requesting approval of the <clears throat> budget adjustment request bar for fiscal year 2019-20. So this is also being submitted to the Higher Education Department and normally due May 1st, but we had an extension on this because of the rapidly changing budget situation. And this bar does reflect changes in numbers related to coronavirus and um, the, actually, related to coronavirus. So it was really important that we get this information in. And it requires regental approval and is normally done towards the end of the fiscal year to make sure that the revenue and expenses that has been approved by the regents actually match what actually happened. So as before, I'll give a very brief overview of the main and branch campus bar report and then Ava Lova will come in and provide information about the health sciences bar. Um, your ebook materials contain many more details on the changes reflected in the bar. So if we go to the next slide, actually, do we have anything, main and branch, next slide after that. Um, the primary drivers of the change in the main campus budget are the increase in CARES Act relief funding that has arrived and funding related to capital projects. Our branch campuses are also experiencing some um, changes related to moderate increases from the prior year. So as you can see in the next slide, which we have the, um, when we have the graphics, other changes and transfers, there we go. So you can see our original budget that we submitted to the state was $884 million. The revised main campus um, and capital is up to 925. So as I mentioned, the main changes in that are CARES Act relief funding that has come in and some funding related to capital expense, which is 22%. And next slide. So in summary, it's a 4.7% net increase. CARES Act came in with $22 million, 9.4 for bond refunding activities related to capital projects, and an additional 9.5 related to non-endowed activities. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ava Lovell to review the changes in the total bar related to HSC. Good morning again. Let's go ahead and advance on then there we go one more there we go so the uh, bar uh, uh, and I, I like the way Regent uh, Sanchez Real said it. it it's really on a normal year kind of normal year like this year it's a cleanup operation for our budget and so it is of course we're required to submit the final revised budget which is the bar by May 15th this year we cannot exceed our budget authority by exhibit and exhibit is 
the, the way that HED looks at everyone's budget and the exhibit means something like ING is an exhibit and research is an exhibit and public service is an exhibit. So we have to make sure we have enough budget in each one of those uh, and there are several more exhibits. So um, only the hospital and the academic HSC are required to submit a bar to HED. Our SRMC and medical group uh, do not have to do that. So next slide. So um, for the academic enterprise, we, uh, our um, request for the bar is a $26.4 million increase in expenditures. And that's about 3.8% of our total um, $688 million in expenditure. And that is all in our public service exhibit. And, and that's um, for the Health Science Center doesn't really fit us, but the rest of higher ed doesn't have clinical. So we get forced to put our clinical into public service. And that's really expense to support physicians and physician efforts. Um, the revenue increase, which is 28.1 million, that came in to support this $26 million increase really came from enhanced uh, Medicaid uh, upper payment limit, um, which was uh, from the state of New Mexico under Medicaid to help support physicians. And that's the majority of that. Um, it does leave us with that, this um, bar leaves us with a 3.3 million positive net margin on the academic side. Next slide. Um, overall, the net margin impact to the uh, Health Science Center uh, has caused us to have some reductions. Um, we have a net margin reduction of about 11 million um, and our academic enterprise uh, was uh, on track to generate a much higher net margin. And so we have included these things in our bar. Next slide. For our UNM hospital, um, the changes for the bar is a 34.4 million net increase in expense, um, mostly as a result of the expense side of our consulting fees uh, related to all of our operational improvements. And this represents a 2.9% of the $1.2 billion original hospital budget. Um, we also had a 56.5 net increase in increase in net revenue uh, due to the operational improvement initiatives again that we were that we were spending the money on um, we also uh, really improved our revenue although we're we are projecting a seven million dollar net loss and that's really um, all due to the uh, our projection of the COVID environment. Now, as of yesterday, some of that changed, right? We did see um, some new uh, hospital revenues, Medicaid uh, revenues that may come in and we're modeling that. So this is what we knew as of two weeks ago, uh, close to what we knew. Um, next slide. And I think I may not, again, we've gone over what's happened to the hospital there. So I'm not gonna go through that in detail. And I believe that is the end of my presentation. Next slide. Yes. Thank you. Stand for well, Thank All you, right. Ava. Questions of Ava? Or Teresa. Or Teresa, aye, right. okay. Okay. Hearing none, uh, I would uh, move, approve, I would ask for a motion to approve the this year's bar, the 1920 adjustment, both for main campus and HSC. Is there such a motion? I so move. This is Rob Schwartz. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second in. This is Regent Henry. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, I'll call for a roll vote. Uh, Regent Schwartz and Henry have already voted. Uh, Regent Lee? Yes. Regent Doty? Yes. Regent Sanchez Real? Yes. Uh, Regent Begay? Yes. And I vote yes, motion passed. Thank you very much for a helpful explanation. Okay, on to the <clears throat> consent docket. I would suggest that we approve the consent docket with the exceptions, well, that we approve consent items B, C, D, E, H, and K. And then we'll take the other items up individually for approval. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved, this is Sandra. 
Is there a second? Second. 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 Thank you, Regent Schwartz. Um, if there's no other questions or comments, uh, I would vote. I would ask for the vote. Uh, and Regent Schwartz and and uh, Begay, I guess it was, that made the second. We'll take your vote. Uh, I'll vote yes. Uh, Regent uh, Sanchez Real. Yes. Uh, Regent Henry. Yes. Regent Lee. Yes. Regent Doty. Yes. Okay. The uh, approval, the consent docket with those exceptions pulled out is approved. Let us now go to the approval of the ASUNM constitutional amendment. And uh, Adam Beterwolf, are you on the line? Yes, yes, I am. Would you re refresh us on, on the substance of this uh, item? Yeah, for sure. So this constitutional amendment is basically a revised procedure of how we will fill ASUNM Senate vacancies. So this revised amendment will allow the vice president to accept applications um, to fill the vacancies if there aren't enough official candidates. Um, so this was passed last fall by the student body and the Senate um, with an 855 for and a 97 against vote. Um, and our last check mark, if you will, um, is our approval from the Board of Regents. So um, it's very basic. Um, I will stand for any questions that you may have. Yes, so can you explain to me what was the procedure? I'm sorry, Regent Brown, this is Marin Lee. Can you? Sure, sure, sure. I'm... Thank you, sorry. You kind of walked away, and so then I just jumped in. Can you explain yeah. to me what was the procedure prior to this amendment? Yeah, for sure. So uh, thank you, Regent Lee. So the procedure prior was that the vice president would just go ahead and make appointments on her own, but this will allow all students to um, go through an application process if they are interested to serve as an ASUNM senator. Um, and if you scroll or go to the next slide, um, the amendment should be highlighted, the one that I signed. Yeah, so um, this goes into detail of just what it looks like according to our law book and our constitution. Um, if you want to go ahead and read that, but basically that's the only change. And then um, once those applications um, are chosen by the vice president, then the the Senate will approve those applications with a two thirds vote from the Senate. And what is your process if, uh, let's say, you the out of the applicant pool, the vice president appoints somebody for that position, and they don't get the vote. They don't they don't get the two thirds majority. Um, then I believe Regent Lee, the vice president, would go back and um, appoint other applicants who um, wanted to serve as ASUNM senators. Okay, one of the reasons I wanted this taken off consent is I think this is very important and I commend you all for coming up with a process to um, clarify how those vacancies are filled. Uh, during my time as a regent, I have seen and heard from students who believed that um, they weren't given any opportunity to join the student leadership, that yeah. it was a very closed group and it was futile to even to attempt to become involved. And I, and I think that that chills, you know, uh, the uh, people from wanting to be involved and, and you, you miss out on some good diverse views. So I, I give you great credit for uh, getting a process in place. And um, I would move that we uh, accept this constitution. Is, is there a second? Second. Okay, second from Regent Doty. Any Doty, other yeah. questions or comments? Hearing, hearing none, I'll call for the question. Uh, Regents uh, Lee and Doty have moved and second. Uh, 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 Regent Henry? Yes. Okay, Regent uh, Begay? Yes. Regent Sanchez Real? Yes. Regent Schwartz? Yes. And I vote yes. So the motion is passed. And thank you for your concern, Regent Lee. It's, it's important that this be done right and inclusively. Uh, next item is item F, the approval of the third quarter financial actions report and certification through March 31 and the third quarter informational financial report, um, informational financial report. Uh, uh, Teresa Constantinidis, do you want to 
pick up on this? So this one actually will be done by our university controller, Elizabeth Metzger. Okay. Liz, are you out there? I'm here. Good morning, Regent and President Brown, Regent Stokes, or President Stokes and members of the committee. Um, I'm here to present the quarterly uh, financial certification report for the third quarter ending March 31st, which is required by the Higher Education Department. And if you're not familiar with this report, it consists of six questions that are essentially related to the university's ability to meet its cash obligation with a final question regarding the university's current budget situation as it compares to the original budget submitted and approved at this time last year. So the sheet, uh, slide we're looking at now shows those questions. The first question of the report asks whether the university had to ask for an advance on our state appropriation. And questions two through five ask if the university failed to make any of our large payment obligations. As you can see from the slide, we've answered questions one through five with a no. Question six asks if the university has experienced any significant actual or anticipated changes not reflected in a budget adjustment request that would result in a substantially reduced year-end fund balance. For this question, we have answered yes, and we have provided the requested supplemental information on the next slide as to the reason for our yes answer. As we previously reported in the first and second quarterly reports, the fall enrollment for the university was down 7%, which exceeded the anticipated enrollment decrease. This enrollment decrease is expected to result in a 4.6 million shortfall in tuition and fees revenues for fiscal year 20. And this shortfall will be covered by central reserves. As of this third quarter report, we do have additional information to provide due to the COVID financial impact to the extent that we were able to measure as of March 31st, which was only a couple of weeks into the university's limited operations period. At the time of this report preparation, we were able to determine that the auxiliaries and athletics revenues would be down approximately 7.7 .7 million due to a combination of lower enrollment reduction in ticket sales, media rights income, and the impact of refunds made to students for housing, dining, and parking due to the move to limited operations. In addition, on the income side, we also were aware at this time of 17.2 million that would be available to UNM from the Department of Education CARES Act with 50% of the 17.2 million earmarked for student aid, which we received on April 27th and was dispersed to our students. We're still waiting for the second 8.6 million for institutional COVID costs, which we applied for on April 22nd. This information was also part of the president's report in addition to further information that we are you know, aware of as is more current. The university's budget adjustment request has incorporated all of the presently known COVID impacts as presented to you earlier. President Stokes' report also included more current information on the financial impacts of COVID. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this report if you have any. Are there any questions for the regents? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Mm -hmm. This is Rob Doty. Second. This is, so, is there a second? Second. Second from. From yeah. Sandra? Okay. Uh, here are further questions or comments. I uh, call for the vote and I'll take those two votes as affirmative. Uh, Re Regent Schwartz? Yes. Regent Henry? Yes. Uh, Regent Begay? Regent Sanchez Real? I made the motion. Sorry, this is Sandra. Yes. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, Re Regent uh, Kim, do you have a vote on this? Uh, yes. And and I vote on it. Did I miss if I missed anybody? Please speak up. Yes. Um, oh, there you are. Thank you. <laughs> You're up a tree there. Uh, okay, let us uh, uh, pass that then. That's approved unanimously. And by the way, before we move on to the athletics, we're two and a half hours into this thing, we have about another dozen things to talk about or to pass. If anybody wants to get up and stretch, I would, I would propose we don't have a formal break. I don't want to lose people. 
uh, but if you want to get up and stretch or you want to run off to the next room for a moment, uh, that's entirely understandable. But I think I'd like to motor on unless there's objections. Okay, all right, let's do that. Okay, item G, the third quarter athletics enhanced oversight program report and the certification through March 31 and the third quarter information on our athletics report by sport through March 31. Uh, any general comments, uh, Director Nunez? Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Regent President Brown, members of the board, President Stokes. Uh, good morning. I know this has already been a long day, so I'm going to try to go speak fast through this part. At any point, please feel free to interject if you have any questions. Um, def definitely uh, unprecedented times for us right now, for everyone, financially, socially. Um, before I get into the third quarter, I want to just highlight a couple of things. Uh, during, you know, during this time, again, our athletic department has really um, focused on being leaders, not just um, as, as they do on the playing fields, but really leaders in this community during crisis. And I think from many things that you've seen from messaging, um, as far as messaging to support, understand everything that's going on around us, to helping, this, helping our community, helping our first responders, helping our frontline workers, as well as our great partners, um, to do everything we can. We feel, for our, our perspective, staying positive, doing as much as we can day to day is, is, is where our, our, our focus needs to be, as well as you know, supporting our student athletes. So hopefully sports, some way, somehow, through, me through all the different mechanisms that, that may be from um, the support from our, gov our governor, our president, and everyone else, that we can be a mechanism to help rally our community, our state, um, to turn the corner. So we're, we're, we're doing everything we can at this point. Um, so as we go into the third quarter, I wanted to make sure that um, Nicole Dobson will jump on here in a minute to discuss the details of both the, the, the F FIOP, whatever the, and the, and our third quarters. Um, th a couple things I want to hit on, which is COVID related items. Many of you heard that this during the F and F, and I just want to be able to, again, um, go through some of the challenges that we faced. After quarter two, some of the things that we were concerned with was our multimedia rights, some ticket sales, because we were still unaware of where we were going to be. We started our multimedia rights late, so we anticipated it was going to be a challenging year just because we started later in the year than, than anticipated, uh, but we were making some great, great headway. Um, unfortunately, right when COVID hit, four areas really hit us really, really difficultly uh, within our department. First and foremost was our media rights. Um, right now, our partners out there are, like many others, are challenged with this, this uncertainty of what's gonna be. So um, that, that, that potential loss there of not making our, our revenue projection, it could be up to about a million dollars. And again, Nicole will go through all that here in a minute. Uh, the other one would be our scholarship fund. Our, with our donations and everything else, right now we're anticipating anywhere between the 15 to 20% reduction in that area. We're gonna continue to work diligently. We're gonna work hard to do what we can, but we're also very understanding of where our donors are, where our fans are. And so we're trying to manage this as well as we can um, during this uncertain time. So those two are two areas that really affected us hard. Then the last two are things we really didn't have any control um, because of this COVID. One is our NCAA distribution. That was a $1.9 million or excuse me, $1.2 million uh, reduction uh, that we weren't, we weren't anticipating from the NCAA. Uh, that on top of our special events. Special events was about a 1.9 um, and that's everything from the high school championships, PBR, parking um, associated with United, with isotopes, other spring sport events, game guarantees for baseball and others, as well as as you might have read in the paper this past weekend, the NCAA track meet um, was projected to be roughly about another estimated million dollars for the community. That's outside of us, but again, just those events, how important they are, not just for our department, our university, but our community as well. So um, those four are major drivers in why this, F, this budget right now, this third quarter is what you're seeing. Um, with that potential loss. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Nicole. And then at, uh, after she's done, I'll touch base on a couple things we've done with FY20 and FY21 as far as looking at our budgets, 
and again, trying to streamline and right size our department as much as we can with these challenging times. Good morning, Regents. So um, as Eddie Ann mentioned, we are here to present the third quarter financials through March for athletics. Um, for this presentation, we'll focus on the summary report. So schedule A, um, highlighting key points of the current year activity. Schedule B, which is also in the packet, um, is the expenses by sport in detail. And then we also have the enhanced fiscal oversight program report, which is essentially the same as schedule A, but it's just in the HED um, reporting format. So if we could scroll to schedule A, wonderful, perfect. Okay, so starting with revenues, total revenues for third quarter were 23.2 million, pulled revenues 17.7 million, and these are lower than prior year due to decreased revenues, primarily for media rights, 1.1 million down, Scholarship fund down about $150,000. Gift in kind down $300,000. And it's important to note with gift in kind, it's a net um, zero to the net bottom line because revenues will be down, so will expenses. Special events and other revenues, $467,000. And this includes parking and concessions, which is driven by ticket sales. Transfers were reduced from prior year. Um, however, we are still pending the PID suite revenue transfer, which is actually going to be made this month. So that's good. That'll be revenue coming in. Decreased revenues are offset by increases. This year, we had an increase in state appropriation, a slight increase in student fees. And then we did book our naming rights a little differently from prior year. So that's what kind of explains that change. Now, pulled revenues projected are projected to be lower than budget. Um, and really the reason behind this is largely driven by the impact of COVID-19. As Eddie had already mentioned, media rights, we are projecting to be down about a million dollars. We are projecting the scholarship fund to also be down about 200,000. The NCAA and Mountain West distribution, again, projecting to be down about 1.2 million. And then the special events and other revenues, we're projecting to be short about 2 million. Um, but it's important to note that the net loss that we're projecting, so revenues minus the expenses, is $450,000. And again, those are big drivers from special events associated with the NMAA High School Championship, the professional bull riding, um, parking, and other spring events. Okay. Jumping into directed revenues, $5.4 million. And so the majority of ticket sales have in fact posted However, we are finalizing the ticket sale revenues with our media rights sponsors, and those actually have already posted this month. Um, we do know that football ticket sales have came in with budget, so that's, that's good news. Um, we are projecting, however, men's and women's basketball to come in slightly short from the budget numbers, but it's just slightly short from the budget numbers. Okay, moving on to expenses. So total expenses, $25.4 million. Salaries and benefits, 10.2 million, which are trending slightly higher than original budget. And these increases are driven by a slight increase in fringe benefits and then the football severance payouts. But we do wanna note that these expenses are gonna be offset by future game guarantee revenues. Other expenses, 1.7 million. Those are trending down, um, again, due to gift and kind. Student costs, 5.1 million, which are lower um, than prior year due to the additional grant and aid support we received as part of our deficit reduction plan. Um, and then this also assumes we do think that grant aid is going to be trended pretty close to the budget, but this assumes no changes with summer, um, and we are evaluating summer grant and aid right now. Travel. 3.7 million, which is higher than prior year due to the increased cost um, and the additional support that we got for men's and women's basketball. And so overall, um, we are expecting the remaining expense categories to trend close to budget. However, given the current circumstances with the changes in operations due to COVID, um, we are expect expecting expenses to actually be down in the next few months. 
And again, most of these expenses are associated with special events, um, sporting events that aren't happening, and then a little bit of decrease in travel. Okay, so overall, the third quarter ended with a negative net balance of $2.25 million. Again, we are projecting to have an anticipated shortfall for fiscal year 20, um, which we think could be up to 3 million plus. For that, I will stand for questions. Just before I add, uh, Regent uh, President Brown, one of the things is, you know, for this, this fiscal year, several things that we've done since the beginning of this, this crisis is we put a spending freeze um, on everything, all purchases in our department. We've also um, adhered to, um, to the university-wide hiring freeze with several positions that we've held. Um, we're tracking everything we can as far as tra travel, everything else, of course, has been seized. So we've done everything we can possibly do at this point. We're kind um, most of, most of our, our expenses, of course, happen in the, in the winter, fall season. So this time's a little bit harder to, to minimize some of those costs. But going into FY21, it's given us an opportunity to really even take several steps forward when it comes to our tra how we travel. Everything else is going to get even more reduced, um, putting, giving us an, an opportunity to really um, be better prepared for FY21 with some of the challenges that may exist um, going forward. And that, again, is going to have several of those different factors working with the Mountain West and the NCAA on reducing and, and uh, kind of doing some different things with all sports, uh, not just one or two. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Are there questions from the regents? Not a question, but a comment. In the Finance and Facilities Committee report, um, Eddie might have mentioned this, but I didn't hear that the detail today, is that several spring fundraisers were not held, which is another deficit in fundraising that happened to occur right when the virus hit. So I thought I'd add that um, piece that that was just bad timing, a lot of things. Thank you, Regent Begay. And what she's, what, what Regent Begay uh, just noted was, um, goes back to the, the low, with our sponsor, our uh, scholarship fund, which we lost our gala, which is a huge event for us. It's been actually two years in a row. We've set, we've set a record there and anticipated this year to be another one. Unfortunately, we, we had to cancel that event as well as our annual golf tournament. Both of those are real huge impacts to our scholarship fund. So unfortunately right now we were not able to have those two Thank you. Other comments or questions from Regents? Well, I, I uh, Regent Brown, this is Marin Lee. I have a uh, just a comment <clears throat> because I, you know, when it rains, it pours. And I just sort of want to do a cautionary tale about relying on some of these funds that, uh, you know, especially the capital improvement funds, those can all be clawed back in a special session. And so I, I just want to put that caveat out there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, at this point, I'd entertain a motion to approve item G, the athletic reports. So moved. Second, Begay. Okay. Second from Senator Begay. Any further comments or questions? Hearing none, I proceed to a vote. I'll take those two uh, as affirmative votes. I'll vote yes. Regent Henry? Yes. Okay, Re Regent Schwartz? Votes yes. Okay, uh, who have I not gotten up? Regent Kim Sanchez-Real? Yes. And Regent Henry, I think we got you. Yes. Okay. All right. I think I that's vote the yes group. Too. I vote yes too, Doug. I'm sorry, Rob. It's all right. It's hard to, I should have a roster in front of me. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, item, um, item I, the uh, approval of project construction. There's three or four items there. And uh, who wants to take that? Is that going to be? Uh, this will be uh, Lisa Riff? Marbury. Lisa, okay. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here with three projects, uh, virtually here with three projects. The first one is to request for capital project construction approval for a Redondo Court parking and circulation project. Uh, this lot primarily provides patient parking and emergency vehicle access to Shack, but it also has ADA accessible parking for the uh, this area of campus, including parking for Mesa Vista Hall, Women's Resource Center, Advisement Enrichment Career Services, Johnson Center, and the Natator Natatorium. 
Um, this project will help maximize the use of the area by increasing parking capacity, improving stormwater management, providing safe drop off and pickup areas, and will improve the design elements in the area. The additional parking spaces will help address the increase in services offered by SHAC, uh, as well as the parking needs for the departments and the buildings that I just discussed. This total pro project budget is $820,000. $450,000 is funded from parking and transportation capital reserves and $370,000 is coming from our FY20 BRNR funds. With that, I'll wait for questions. Questions? This is Sandra. I had um, asked the question in FNF and, and I thought I would repeat it here is that under the guidelines that we're operating with with COVID that there are um, ways that you can continue doing construction given that's a necessary operation. Please clarify if I understood that right. Um, Regent Begay, that's correct. So uh, at FNF, I mentioned that um, construction has been deemed one of the essential businesses by the governor. Um, and so our team, Planning, Design, and Construction, is working with our vendors, our general contractors, and architects to continue those uh, projects and keep them going. Um, we are, pd &C is operating with their own, or we'll, we'll, we'll CDC and, and national guidelines on social distancing and those proper safety protocols. And we also require those uh, safety protocols from all of our vendors, which they have provided to us. So an example is when you have to go on site and you have to have a site meeting, only a few people, you know, limited number of people can go in. No, no, so, so many people only can go into the facility or the building and those kinds of things. The way they have uh, hold their meetings, they don't share their equipment, those kinds of protocols are in place. Thank you. I just also wanted to add a comment um, that in this venue for UNM having an ability to continue work, which keeps people employed and building our infrastructure in spite of our circumstances is very um, admirable. So I'm, I'm very proud to hear about what we're able to do. Yes, thank you. It's good for, it's a good economic driver for the state of New Mexico and for the, the people that it employs. So yeah, that's a good point. Regent Brown, you're muted, but I have a comment. <laughs> Still can't hear you. Oh, I, it, it, it wouldn't allow me to unmute for some reason. Anyway, please go ahead. Um, and I think this might actually be a better question for Francie Cordova, and I don't want to put her on the spot, but I did see that she was one of the participants for the Zoom meeting. What does this do with regard to our issues with ADA compliance and ensuring that uh, we're addressing, because I think that actually is one of our big, my biggest fears is projects that go to um, make our campus more ADA friendly. And so I was wondering if there was any thought on prioritizing projects and if this is one of those projects that would help us um, further our ADA compliance. Uh, Chairman Brown, Regent Lee, can you all hear me? Yes. San Francisco. Um, we are proceeding right now with an RFP for the transition plan specifically for buildings. And this one will be included in, in our evaluation. Um, the newer buildings, of course, typically are ADA compliant. Um, and so we will be watching that closely and we will also be looking at the buildings and the path of travels to all buildings in the new RFP, which we are about to finish up right now and send out for vendors to bid on for the transition plan. Wonderful. What about this project in particular? Does this help with, uh, was this an area that had been designated? I, I don't remember specifically, but I will get that information to you regionally. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Lisa Marbury, do you want to talk about Taos? Uh, do you want to do all the projects at the same time or approve each one? Uh, well, let's approve each one, I guess, probably the soundest way to go. Uh, okay, on the Redondo, Redondo Court, do we have a motion? I move approval. Okay, is there a second? Second, Begay. Okay, second. And then uh, any further questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll go down the list. Uh, Regent Lee and Begay are already on a yes. Uh, Rob Doty? Yes. Uh, Rob Schwartz? Yes. Melissa Henry? Yes. Kim Sanchez-Real? 
Yes. And myself. Okay, that's a yes. So it is indeed approved. I now have a roster. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, second item. Okay. Lisa, so, Barbara. Yes. So the second uh, project I bring forward is the for UNM Taos College Pathways to Career Center. Uh, this is an 11,650 square foot building that will house the Centers for Academic Success and Achievement, the Taos Education and Career Center, and the Career Services Programs. And the it's all clustered around the UNM Taos Library and the Special Collections. The building will contain one-on-one -on -one tutoring spaces, small dual-use classroom and meeting rooms, faculty and staff offices, and student work and support spaces. Uh, the Pathway Center will also preserve historical documents and media re related to the natural and historic resources of the Northern New Mexico as part of the university's Developing Natural Resources Program. The total estimated project budget on this is $5,575,000. That is made up of $4,300,000 from the 2018 GO bonds, uh, Taos match of $1,075,000 from the uh, ERG, EGRT, and then it does have $200,000 from the 2019 general fund appropriation. Thank you, Lisa. Is there a motion uh, to approve this item? May I have Agent a Henry motion to, to approve? Second by Okay, item. and there's a second. Rob second. Schwartz seconding. Rob Schwartz seconds. Uh, is there uh, any further comment or questions? Hearing none, I'll go for a roll. I'll take those two as affirmative. Uh, Regent Lee? Yes. Um, Regent uh, Begay? Yes. Uh, Reg uh, I vote yes. Uh, Kim Sanchez Real? Yes. Okay, I think I got everybody. Um, okay, that, that's unanimous at this point. Uh, let's move on to a UNM Valencia infrastructure project. Thank you. So this final project is for UNM Valencia. It's an infrastructure project. This project involves the consolidation of several capital needs at the UNM Valencia campus into one comprehensive project. The project includes remodeling a portion of the student union building, a primary lecture hall, A101, and it totals 6,700 square feet of building renovation. But it also includes a parking lot and road rehabilitation um, and other landscaping around the campus. This project updates the student areas and provides safe and clear access to buildings. These renovations will extend the useful life and reduce existing deferred maintenance needs that they have at UNM Valencia. This project budget is $4,900,000 or $4, all of which is being funded from the UNM Valencia Local 2018 County Bond. Good. Thank you, Lisa. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Marin. Oh, okay. And uh, is there a second from? Sandra. From Sandra. We'll take those two as affirmative votes. Regent Todi? Yes. Regent Schwartz? Yes. Regent Henry? Yes. Uh, Regent Sanchez Real? Yes. And I vote yes, so it is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last item on the uh, removed from the consent agenda is the approval of the capital outlay submission to the HED. Um, Lisa, are you gonna take this or? Actually, this is Teresa, I'll go ahead and take Teresa. it. Okay. Regent Brown. So I'm very pleased to be able to bring forth the UNM capital outlay request package for fiscal year 2021. And this item comes to you in two parts. And we bring these two parts of the regions each year for your approval. So we can then submit these plans to the New Mexico Higher Education Department by their July 1st deadline. The deadline is normally June 1st, but this year because of all of the constraints, we were given an extra month. As a reminder, these are requests for funding that will be considered in the fiscal year 2021 year in the budget process for 2021 for allocation in 21, 22 and beyond. And as um, Regent Lee mentioned, anything can be clawed back or not done. So we're, we're following the process as if we have a normal year and we'll just have to see how it all plays out. So the first part is our capital priorities that require state funding. And I'll be speaking to the main campus and branch campus items and later on in the agenda, um, the Health Sciences Center will review the Health Sciences Capital Priorities, however, they are listed on the sheet in front of you for you to see. So for the main campus, there are uh, three 
recommendations here. The first one is the College of Fine Arts facilities renewal for a total of $5.3 million. That is made up of three projects, a Mesa del Sol HVAC repair at $2.2 million, the Center for the Arts access control for a couple buildings at $720,000, and then a Center for the Arts roof replacement at $2.4 million. So this request for the College of Fine Arts is a carryover from fiscal year 2019-20 request. Last year, the UNM Capital Projects leadership team advised the president that this was the priority and ultimately UNM requested $10 million for facilities renewal in the College of Fine Arts. Unfortunately, no appropriation for this was made by the 2020 legislature. So this year, the Capital Projects leadership team recognizing that this should still be the number one priority, scaled it back from its original 10 million down to $5.3 million. Now the other two requests are for modernizing research facilities at $2 million and fire safety at $2.5 million for the total of $9.8 million for the main campus. For the branches, each branch has one request for Gallup, it's facilities repair and renewal at 1.125 million. For the Los Alamos campus, they're requesting campus-wide infrastructure renovations of $1.8 million. Taos, also infrastructure improvements at 1.875. And Valencia, a learning commons resource center renewal at $600,000. So in total, including what is going to be requested by Health Science Center is $41,215,000. If you have any um, specific questions about any of the projects, we can provide additional information. So I'd like to stop there and get the approval of the board or answer any questions related to the 2021 capital project requests for main campus and the branches. I move approval. A second, this is Rob Schwartz seconding. And Doug, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, I'll take those, those first two as, uh, as approvals. And that was uh, Regent Schwartz and Regent Begay. Were you the motioner on that, I think? Uh, Regent Doty? Yes. Uh, Regent Henry? Yes. Regent Sanchez-Real? Yes. And I vote yes. I think that covers us. And uh, let us move on then to the HSC portion of this. Actually, um, we're going to do the five-year plan, and then you can go into the rest of your approvals. And HSC, when they get to theirs, will do their requests, if that's all right. Oh, however you'd like. Okay. All right. So this will be fast. Um, as you know, we're also required to submit by July 1st, a five-year plan of all of our planned capital projects, regardless of fund source. So these aren't the ones we're necessarily requesting general funds or ING funds for. They're just all of them and they must be approved by the Board of Regents. So therefore included in, um, I think it's like pages 94 to 106, the next group of pages, you can see the five-year capital plan for the main campus and each of the branch campuses has their own five-year plans. Everything we know of at this time that exceeds $300,000 is included on this list. So we need a request or we need an approval of this list to submit it to higher education. Do we have a motion to that effect? Motion to approve. This is Regent Henry. Okay, and a second? Second by Regent Begay. Okay, thank you. Uh, further comments or questions? I'll call the vote. Uh, Regent Lee? Yes. Regent Doty? Yes. Regent Swartz? Yes. Regent Sanchez Real? Yes. And Regent Brown says yes also. Thank you very much. Um, let's now talk about the, um, I guess the HSC portion of this is appropriate, Teresa? Actually, you probably should just go through your agenda. So um, start with the ASAR and you'll eventually get down to HSC because it'll be in the order of the book in front of the regents. So next I'd suggest the ASAR uh, approvals. Well, these are the degrees that are shown here. Correct. That's the next one on the agenda. Okay. Well, well in your capital, uh, in your capital uh, review, you skipped over the HSC ones. Um, Did so you want that 
<laughs> Regent Brown, what happened was when the HSC reviewed the um, these requests, they they passed it along to the Board of Regents for approval, but did not actually vote them into a vote to approve them. So they are now showing up in the regular HSC action items list. It's showing up okay, at the but, bottom but of then the. That, so you'll then see that them. approval incorporate, incorporated the HSC then? No, I think you should um, hear from uh, Dean Levy on, on them. So you'll hear them later when they do their HSC items, the whole list of HSC items. Hey, Doug, could I clarify? I think- um, Yes, please, I'm a little confused now. Yes. The committee action items, the agenda items that were in consent from FNF were taken off and, and viewed, but the HSC committee has their report coming later in the agenda and that includes some of their capital projects. That's correct. Okay, that's fine. We'll include them at that point then. All right, let's move then on to the degree candidates and uh, were you presenting those, Teresa, or is that Finney Coleman? I believe that's Finney Coleman. Okay, Finney. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Regent Brown, the rest of the <laughs> regents and president. Um, we have, as you can see, the numbers, uh, 4,204 uh, pending degrees for spring 2020. Uh, these, agrees, uh, these degrees were approved at both Faculty Senate and at ASAR. And I'll stand for questions. Any questions? Move I'd like to know who that, who's that young student that you're holding there. <laughs> okay. Um, is, there, is there a motion to approve? So, so moved, Marin. Regent Lee and second by? Kim. By whom? By, by Kim. Okay. Uh, I'll take that second by Kim as affirmatives. No questions or comments further. Regent Doty? Yes. Regent Schwartz? Yes. Regent Henry? Yes. Regent Begay? Yes. And Brown, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Finney. That's a wonderful to see that. I just wish we could have a proper celebration, but maybe we'll catch up at some future time. Uh, Lisa Lindquist, uh, would you talk about the new items? Is Lisa Lindquist uh, here, Dean? I was just talking for about 10 minutes and was muted. I apologize. <laughs> I know how that is. That's my favorite. <laughs> um, again, hello, President Regent Brown, Regents, and President Stokes. My name is Lisa Lindquist, and I'm the director of the Lobo, excuse me, the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center. Um, it's my privilege to bring forward two requests for posthumous degrees. Um, these degree requests come from faculty, staff, and family members. And today I speak on behalf of Kiana, oh, excuse me, it looks like Najee is the first one. Uh, Najee Flowers was a member of our football team, as well as a young man who was interested in pursuing his degree. Um, he was looking to apply towards the sign language interpreting program once, um, right before his passing. And I just wanted to share something that um, one of his recommenders shared, Amanda Lujan. She said that he had a natural way of interacting with members of the deaf community. He showed care, compassion, and respect that cannot be taught in the classroom. And because of this, I believe he would have offered unique skill sets making him a great candidate for the sign language interpreting program. He has met all of the qualifications to receive a posthumous degree, and this was approved by Faculty Senate and ASAR. Do you have any questions for me? Any questions of, of Lisa? Uh, entertain a motion to approve. So move, Marin. Marin, is there a second? Who's the second? Sandra. Sandra, thank you. Thank you, too. Uh, Hearing no other questions or comments, uh, I'll take those as affirmatives. And is uh, Regent Doty? Yes. Regent Schwartz? Regent Schwartz and Regent Henry? Yes, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, trouble unmuting, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, Regent uh, Sanchez-Real? Yes. And uh, I vote yes. And with our, our, our 
profound regrets. Uh, we certainly approve unanimously. Uh, next one, would you talk about Kiana? Absolutely. Um, so Kiana Kalem uh, was towards the end of her degree and was set to graduate. Um, she unfortunately uh, was stuck with a terminal illness. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with her mother um, about her at length and um, really she just wanted me to share with you that she was truly committed to her education um, even throughout her illness. Um, she really strived to um, stay the course, attain her degree, and was working very hard in the College of Education uh, toward that pursuit. Um, and unfortunately was unable uh, very, by a very short margin to attain that goal. Um, but you can see from the letter from Dr. Riffenberry that she was in good standing as she is um, able to receive a posthumous degree. Um, I know that just from speaking to her mother, um, that their entire family would feel grateful if this was approved. And um, I, are there any questions? Hearing no questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve. I move, move. Marin. Marin and Kim, I'll take it as a second. Yep. Uh, Regent Doty? Yes. Regent Schwartz? Yes. Regent Henry? Yes. And I vote yes. I don't think I missed anybody. Regent Breguet, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, unanimous. And again, with our, our profound sympathies uh, to Kiana. Thank, thank you very you. much. Um, thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> thank you. Our next is a, <clears throat> a very important enrollment update from Vice President Dan Garcia. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to go over some of the metrics that we've been tracking our, and are aware of. Um, there are a lot of things that we know, a lot of things that we don't know, and then there's some gray area in between. So I'm going to talk primarily about incoming first year student figures, uh, but I'll touch on continuing student data as well. So up until this point, most of our key indicators were applications for admission, offers of admission. At this point, we do have some additional information. So the things I'm going to cover are what we call pieces of the puzzle. Key indicators, what we know now regarding student behaviors, some external data that you're probably very familiar with, and I've selected a couple of national surveys that I think give us a, a good sense of what the environment is. Other internal indicators and data, uh, we'll, we'll share some housing figures, some new student orientation figures. I'd also like to talk about our yield efforts, some of the things that we're focusing on now to encourage and support those students who have been offered admission to select UNM and enroll in the fall. And then obviously there's the unknown. There's a lot that we don't know. And President Stokes has spoken about some of the circumstances that we're under, as well as some of the steps that we're taking to uh, develop plans and contingencies. Uh, next slide, please. So these key indicators that we're looking at currently, and we share regularly with senior leadership, uh, are, of course, our offers of admission, scholarship acceptance numbers and rates. Uh, and we'll go into more detail about each of these. I mentioned new student orientation, housing contracts, admitted and applicant student surveys, cancellations of applications, offers of admission. This, this is an important number that we'll talk about. And then, of course, fall registrations as of yesterday. Next slide. This is, a, this is a slide that you're probably familiar with that we've shown before. The columns over on the left side indicate final figures for the enrollment and admission funnel for 2017 through 2019. Uh, you can see as of last Friday, figures for uh, 2020. And you can also see last year at the same point in time. So where we're at currently is an increase of almost 20% in offers of admission to students. It's about 1,400 more offers of admission. Uh, that's a good sign. We're not yet at the admit rate that we hit last year. We're at about 64%. The challenge we have right now is that we've made a 
probably about three or four percent more offers of admission to New Mexico residents. The majority of the offers have gone out of state. And of course, the yield is typically lower for those students, about 19% on offers of admission to enroll. And we also know that national data indicate that students are planning to stay uh, to some degree closer to home. Uh, one of the other pieces I wanna to mention too is our cancellation rate. It's, it's interesting because last year at this time we had 755 students that we had offered admission to indicated that they didn't want to take the offer, they're going elsewhere. This year it's only 296. That's a decrease of 450 uh, or 60%. We think that has more to do with the extension of the, um, uh, the de declaration date, the intent to enroll date uh, from May 1st as it typically is to June 1st. We joined about 400 other universities in extending this date to give students greater opportunity to weigh their options. So I think by June 1st, we're gonna have a better sense of, uh, of student plans. Next slide, please. This is an, another interesting set of data, uh, something we didn't have a couple of months ago. These are scholarship acceptances. So over in the left-hand column, you're gonna see that in uh, the dark font, these are out-of-state waivers and scholarships. Uh, in the red font, we've got those that are offered largely, uh, almost exclusively to in-state students. And in the middle of this table, you can see the number of offers that we made for each of these scholarships and waivers in 2019 at this point, and how many students had accepted those, uh, and also the percent that accepted. For 2020, we've made, uh, we've made about uh, 325 more offers of admission, uh, offers of, I'm sorry, we've made substantially higher offers of scholarships to students. And we've had 324 additional students this year compared with last year accept their scholarship offer. About three weeks ago, that number was closer to 600, probably reflective of again, the May 1st date last year versus the June 1st date that we've given students to accept their scholarships this year. Again, I think by June 1st, we're gonna see the accept rate continue to increase. So this is overall a good sign. We've had more students offered scholarships and more students accept those scholarships. Uh, next slide. This is probably more uh, important in terms of what it means. So last year, we know the final figures for yield or number of students, percent of students that enrolled uh, that we offered the scholarship to. And then in the next column, going to the right, are, are the numbers of students that enrolled or the yield on those that indicated they were accepting their scholarship. For fall 2020, if we applied those same yields on offer and accept, you can see down at the bottom how the numbers would play out. There's a big gap between those two numbers. Uh, so I would say probably the yield on accept column to the far right is gonna be the most uh, useful to us at this point. As it stands right now, if the yield on acceptance of those scholarship holds, it, it seems to indicate we would see another 147 scholarship students enroll at UNM in the fall. This is not a typical year, so there's no guarantee, but at least it is a positive indicator at this point. And as we see the acceptances go up by June 1st, we'll have uh, updated numbers for you as well. Next slide, please. New housing deposits and contracts. These numbers are as of May 1st. This is a comparison for the university housing and one of our partners, uh, ACC. This largely represents uh, new leases. There are some that uh, are included in this figure that include transfer students and late renewals, but the majority are first year students. We're about even with last year at this time. Uh, our plans, our enrollment plan this year was to be very aggressive and increase enrollments uh, across the board and continuing in new students. This is not an uh, a usual year. So this, although the numbers are flat, is actually positive that we have this degree of interest uh, in this environment 
that uh, uh, this year uh, in terms of comparison with last year. Next slide, please. New student orientation registrations. These are figures as of uh, the 6th of May. And although you can see that we are down for orientation registrations by about 16%, two weeks ago, this figure was, was a negative 25%. Uh, it's largely reflective, we believe, in the original uh, plan to offer on-campus new student orientation and student concern that they are uh, that, uh, making travel plans at that time. Since the last few weeks, we have launched uh, the online orientation option, which I believe is actually a very good product that's been developed by that team. Uh, it is, uh, we've seen those numbers decrease. I think over time, we're going to see it continue to decrease as well. That gap. Next slide, please. Uh, student registrations at this point, largely we're talking about continuing students, some new graduate student registrations. They are down eight and a half percent, uh, compared with last year at this time. So you can see that only 11,000 students have registered for the fall. We know that our total student enrollment is closer to 23, 24,000 students. It's less than half of our total enrollments that we'll expect. So it's still early. Uh, also, by way of comparison, last year, the same report at the same time showed that fall 2019 registrations were down 8.3% compared with fall of 2018. It's been a downward trend in student enrollments, uh, but it is comparable with what we were seeing last year at this time. So again, not what we had uh, planned for or made uh, our target, but at least there's some degree of encouragement that student behaviors are, are fairly consistent with what we've seen uh, in the last year. The bright spot is that the percentage of continuing students that are eligible to register for fall, meaning those that were enrolled in the spring and are not planning to graduate, is about even with last year at this time. So there's an indication that students who were enrolled in the, in the spring are planning to come back, uh, at least those that have registered thus far. Of course, the total figure is down by 625 students. And again, that reflects the, the downward trend uh, in enrollment that the university has experienced over the last several years. Next slide, please. So some of the national survey data that you may be aware of and a couple that I've selected that I think give us some indication of where mindset is across the nation uh, is first the Ruffalo Noah Levitt survey that was administered in March. Uh, this was very early on in the pandemic, and there was a great deal of concern then among uh, high school seniors in particular uh, that, that the survey was aimed at. Um, the, big, the big numbers are 86% being very concerned that cost will be even more important uh, to their college plans. Uh, about a quarter of them were considering deferring enrollment at that time to their preferred school. Uh, that could... Uh, that could be a very uh, strong reaction that a, that a high school senior might have in terms of considering what things might mean for them in the fall. And then 44% having second thoughts about the school they're likely attend, to attend in the fall. Next slide, please. This was a much larger survey that was administered over a greater period of time and extending into mid-April. And it, it uh, ultimately reached 23,000 respondents that were high school seniors. We can see that the number had dropped to about 7%, indicating that they were considering not enrolling or deferring uh, admission for a year. We're seeing Nash, other national surveys that indicate students are still planning to go to college. Uh, they're not giving up on that hope. Uh, although still a sizable number, 40%, are reconsidering the schools on their list. It's not unusual uh, late into spring for many students to be reconsidering schools, but we're pretty deep into that period. And so given that many universities have extended uh, their deadline for response to June 1st, uh, they're contemplating still their options. 
Uh, and again, continuing deep into April, we see this figure of 88% of seniors very concerned about ability to pay. There were very few respondents from New Mexico in the survey, uh, only 75 seniors, uh, and 77% of them said they'd already made their final decision where to enroll. Next slide, please. We administered our own student survey to those that had been offered admission uh, and those that had just simply applied. We received 574 responses. This was part of a larger national survey and the responses may not necessarily reflect attitudes about UNM specifically, given that only about 11% of high school seniors apply to just one college or university. So of those, we're seeing some consistency with national surveys um, that uh, a large number of these students, the majority are saying they know where they want to attend or they plan to attend college regardless. 26% um, say college plans have changed. And when asked what has changed, 33% are saying attend a college closer to home. We're seeing that in national figures as well. Uh, that's good for us in many ways. We're the largest metropolitan area in the state of Texas, uh, sorry, the state of New Mexico. But we are also um, very dependent each year on enrollments from across the nation and across the globe. 42% uh, indicate that they will live at home while attending college. And then 30%, this is interesting, will enroll at a less expensive college. We do have a distinct advantage in terms of being one of the least expensive four-year public research one universities in the nation. Uh, but 16%, only 16% are indicating that that change may go uh, uh, drive them to a, a community college. Huge numbers of students are expressing concerns, anxiety, um, saying that they're excited, they're worried and overwhelmed. Only 16% of the respondents to the survey that we administered to our admitted pool and applicant pool indicated they were comfortable or calm. And I'll address this a little bit more in just a moment. Next slide, please. So other indicators that we can expect, as I mentioned, new student orientation registrations will continue to come in. I anticipate they were gonna continue to improve. Uh, in terms of that gap compared with last year at this time, we've got that June 1st scholarship deadline to accept and then a extended June 1st housing priority date. We've extended the Lobo first year promise to June 1st. This is a commitment to New Mexico residents that are at the median income level or below. We are going to ensure that college tuition and fees that are mandatory are going to be covered through, through a combination of institutional, state and federal resources. Uh, and then we plan to administer in a few weeks the admitted student questionnaire. Uh, this is going to all be all go to all the students that have been admitted to the university to ask them uh, their perceptions about our institution compared with peers uh, and help us better understand the influences in their decision on where they may plan to enroll. We have a series of smaller, shorter surveys to applicants and admitted students. Uh, that are going to be accompanied by a video message from us uh, inviting them to participate. Seven questions. One of the questions is going to be, are we still among your college choices? It's going to give us a much stronger indication up to, up to this point of what their, their plans are. Next slide, please. So yield efforts. Some of the things that we were very heavily engaged in our communications. We know that students and parents are indicating nationally they want more contact and more information about what's happening at colleges and universities. And so we've been making phone calls, sending text messages, and engaging with students uh, about their anxieties and plans and trying to assuage those. Uh, but we also have been engaged in very specific communications to parents. Uh, not only have we developed a class of 2024 website that's been up for some time to give ongoing updated information about uh, our institution and the steps we're taking to ensure the health and safety of students, uh, but what their next steps might be. Uh, and these personal messages are coming from me with contact information, allowing them to reach out directly to me with questions. And I've received a number and it's been actually a pleasure to engage and find out what their concerns and needs are. 
We have been uh, delivering virtual information sessions and tours to students. It's a mix right now of not only 2020, but 2021 uh, prospects. Since we're not able to visit with families on campus for a tour, we're delivering these information sessions virtually and we're getting a very good response. Uh, we've made substantial additional offers to New Mexico residents, not just additional offers, but we've been increasing the amounts to try to offset costs of attendance in college and um, attract more students to the institution. About two weeks ago, we made 350 additional offers to New Mexico residents above what we had already made. Uh, and then, of course, financial aid awards notate eligibility to the low for, of the Lobo first year promise. We want students absolutely to know and recognize that they have been awarded this commitment uh, and that their tuition fees are covered. So those financial aid award letters have been modified to make this clear to them. We've been doing radio, TV, and billboard advertising to reinforce our presence and identify locally. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I think this may be the last slide. Additional efforts. We are reaching out to branch campus students that may be ready for transfer. Um, there are substantial numbers of students that come to us from the branch campuses. We do not want them to choose to enroll at UNM Albuquerque if they are not ready. And so we're having very good conversations with them about their preparations and supporting them if they are choosing to come in the fall. If they're not quite ready, and through those conversations, we're helping them understand what they may do to prepare. We know that students are gonna be most successful as transfers, uh, the more credit they bring in, and the better prepared that they are overall. We're allowing students that are having challenges getting their, um, their transcripts from high school to us to self-report their GPA and offering conditional admission to them. And we're doing that also with test scores. We're doing it in alignment with the admission requirements and standards that have been established. And it is a conditional admission. The expectation is that we will receive these uh, at some point prior to the start of the term. With testing uh, a challenge, we're giving students the option not to submit those given that 80% of the students we admit, we do not admit with consideration to test score and or allowing them, which is probably going to be a requirement anyway, to take a placement test prior to registration, which will give us a better sense of their preparation for college level coursework. And then finally, we've been reaching out to students that we admitted in fall of 2019, thousands of them, that chose not to attend UNM, but residents of the state that left for other institutions across the nation. We know that more students want to stay closer to home, and we think that this applies not just to high school seniors entering college for the first time, but those students that may want to return uh, from other institutions and be closer to us. And we're in the process of uh, communicating with those students that have reached out to us to help them um, help essentially honor their original offer and let them get enrolled at UNM in the fall as easily as possible. I think that was the last slide. Indeed. Dan, I just have to comment, Doug, here. Uh, really appreciate all your efforts and how comprehensive your approach has been and you're keeping us up to date. And we're just gonna keep all those fingers crossed that indeed uh, they come. It's been such a challenging and unusual year. Comments, questions from the regions? Just a few comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Garcia, for a great report. You, you know, we touched on some of these issues when you first came to UNM, and I think you've done an outstanding job of addressing some of the concerns that I had. And I know um, you've been working real hard to get the team together in, in all the outreach efforts and the interviews. So I just wanted to thank you, and I appreciate what you've done today. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Okay, this is information item not requiring action, but thanks thanks for all your actions, Dan. Uh, let us move on to the Compliance and Audit and Compliance Committee, which was I chair. And Victor, uh, would you please briefly uh, go through the first two items? Yes, thank you, President Brown. 
Uh, the Audit Compliance Committee have met twice. On uh, April 7th, we held a special meeting for the presentation, selection and presentation of the uh, external audit firm. Uh, the Audit Committee approved Moss Adams and KPMG to once again be our external auditors for the fiscal year 2020 audit. And uh, Liz Metzger will have more information on the selection process and uh, the specifics on the contract for the external audits. On May 7th, we had a full meeting uh, to actually have the entrance conference for the 2020 uh, financial statement audit. Uh, so even in the current situation, the external auditors are, uh, have already begun audit procedures for the uh, 2020 audit. We uh, had a presentation and approval of the Los Alamos branch uh, audit. We had uh, six findings and six recommendations. The report is now currently at uh, legal counsel uh, going through a redaction review for anything that needs to be redacted. And hopefully uh, by next week, we'll get that review back and we'll, we'll be able to upload uh, the audit report to our internal audit website. Uh, the risk assessment, uh, university-wide risk assessment survey was launched on April 30th. And we have uh, currently uh, our uh, deadline for to complete the survey is May 28th. The uh, risk assessment team are still targeting uh, uh, the completion of our risk assessment procedures and uh, propose audit, uh, propose work plans by August of this year. Um, one other thing I'd like to just inform the, 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 uh, uh, the board is uh, Chief Compliance Officer Franzi Cordova uh, reported that the uh, President's Ethics Task Force has completed our review and uh, uh, our charges. And uh, I believe last week the final report was submitted to the President's office and uh, internal audit and compliance offices are, look forward to implementing the recommendations that are noted in the final report. Uh, finally, uh, Compliance Director Rob Burford presented a uh, comprehensive Clary, uh, Clary crime reporting for UNM on-campus incidents as compared to other peer institutions. So that was a very extensive report that was presented and uh, that report could be made available to, to the board as requested. Uh, other than that, I'll entertain any questions. Any questions to Victor? Well, would you, uh, Liz, then, would you pick it up from here regarding the uh, approved contract? Yes, thank you, Regent Brown. Thank you, Victor. Um, there isn't a slide for this, but I can uh, briefly discuss the process of the selection and approval of the university external auditor that was presented to the audit committee at the April 7th meeting, which Victor mentioned. So UNM solicited proposals for the FY20 external audit of the university, which included its 10 component units, the NCAA required procedures on athletic activity, and the financial statement reviews of KUNM and KNME, which is required by the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. We received three proposals, which were evaluated by a committee of six university employees representing the university hospital, the UNM Foundation, UNM Health Sciences Center, and the Main Campus Controllers Organization and Main Campus spo Sponsored Projects area. The committee members independently evaluated each proposal, and the firm receiving the highest score was Moss Adams, with a subcontract to KPMG for the audits of the clinical areas. In addition to Moss Adams and KPMG, some staff from the state audit office will also be working on the audit, working very closely with Moss Adams. As I mentioned, the selection of Moss Adams was approved by the audit committee. Our contract has been submitted to the state audit office and was approved. And we had an entrance conference last week on May 7th. And uh, some of the auditors are actually already beginning their interim work uh, this week. So that's kind of where we're at, and I can answer any questions if there are any. Any questions of Liz? Thank you very much for a helpful report. You're welcome. Uh, Regent, Regent uh, Begay, would you introduce Vahid, who, whose news just keeps getting better? <laughs> yes, more good news from the Finance and Facilities Committee. Um, we had covered majority of the items either through the consent agenda and also through the um, individual reports that were given, but we have one other piece of good news, and I believe, Teresa, you're going to um, present, and it's the uh, results of the advanced 
refunding of UNM Series 2012 bonds. So I'm just double checking to make sure Vahid isn't on the list. I don't think I saw him. I, I am here. Oh, good. Vahid, do you want to go ahead and give that presentation? Certainly. Thank uh, you. Good afternoon, uh, Regents, President Stokes. Uh, when we brought forth the bond refunding of the UNM 2012 bonds, uh, the Regents at that time approved delegating the, the pricing authority to the President and the Senior Vice President. Uh, the terms of that delegated authority basically provide that the results uh, of the refunding will come back to the board at a, at a later date, hence the uh, information item today. The, the results of the refunding were very favorable. Uh, the bond was uh, extremely well received out in the marketplace and the university was able to uh, benefit from very low interest rates. Uh, I believe the item is tab 12 in your packet. Um, if you look at that, the second page, which is up on the screen now, uh, the third column was the previous debt service that the university was paying. The third column is the new debt service. Uh, and then the fourth column uh, on the right is the savings or the difference between those two, uh, between those two columns. The, the refunding itself achieved a total uh, present value savings of 7.92%, and the average annual debt service savings will be approximately $391,000, uh, and that will be, the term of that is from fiscal year 21 through fiscal year 32. So uh, that is, uh, concludes my presentation. Excellent. I'm so glad you guys were uh, vigilant watching interest rates uh, to our great advantage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? I didn't Hearing know. none, we'll, we'll move on to Regent Sh Schwartz, uh, if you'd cover the Health Science uh, Committee. Yes, we have a list of um, uh, candidates for their degrees and um, we have uh, Dr. Levy from um, uh, the Health Sciences Center. Dr. Levy, are you still here? Yes, I am. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. We appreciate your patience and your presence. Thank you. Um, I'd like to present the 521 graduates of the Health Sciences Center for graduation. It encompasses colleges of nursing, pharmacy, population health, the graduate degree programs, and the School of Medicine. Do we hear a mo motion? So moved, Marin. Marin, okay. This is the and, second. Uh, this is Regent Henry. All right. Thank you very much. Any further comment or question? Hearing none, uh, let us move to a vote. Uh, Regent Doty. Yes. Regent Schwartz. Yes. <clears throat> Regent Begay. Yes. Regent Sanchez Real. Yes. And myself, yes, uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Rob, the next, next Thank item. Thank you very much, Dr. Levy. The, Thank you, uh, Amy. Sorry, the only other thing um, from our agenda from the Health Sciences Committee is the uh, capital outlay budget. And in fact, um, we had decided at the Health Sciences Committee, as I recall it anyway, that uh, we would defer to um, the F and F Committee on that issue since that same the uh, same capital outlay was presented to F and F. Well, we didn't vote that in at that time. Let's maybe have a separate vote unless I missed some procedure. Yeah, so I uh, think that Teresa, we had assumed that it would go Teresa. to F and F, and as a consequence, there wasn't actually a committee decision by Health Sciences Committee on that issue. So. Okay. Um, well, sorry, this is Teresa, Teresa, and I'm sorry about that. We must have just had our lines crossed. So we do need a vote to approve the yes. $26 million appropriation request for um, capital planning for HSC. Thank you. This is Sandra Begay. I move approval. Is there a second? This is Melissa Henry. I move to second that. Okay, are there further questions or comments? Yes, this is Regent Lee. Am I correct in hearing that there was no discussion? Was this just, uh, was there any discussion in HSC about these? There uh, was. I mean, we actually noted what we saw. Uh, we noted what the, uh, uh, I don't think that there was any problem with that, with it. Um, it's just that we were de um, deferring to the F and F committee so that there wouldn't be two independent committee decisions um, on the same item, both being uh, uh, recommended, uh, uh, both with, with uh, recommendations 
to the full regions. Uh, we were trying to clean up the process, I think, and maybe in, in doing that, we undermine the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that, well, yes. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, all of what is it, the pathway to hell is paved with good intention kind of thing. <laughs> uh, uh, my question, I did have a question though on the sure. subject of, you know, I, I know the cancer vault has been one that has come up uh, and as well is needed. Um, I'm just wondering, the priorities went through the same kind of uh, vetting as main campus. I see Ava doing her, you know, wave and shake. Um, are these similar from uh, years before or are these, are these, did these move up the list based on other uh, issues and concerns? And I felt guilty about taking the, uh, this opportunity away from Ava anyway. So, you, so Ava, you're gonna get your chance after all. Ava, would you comment please, thanks. Yes, yeah, so can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, so yes, first of all, we did go through this uh, at length in the HSC committee, um, and we had a, a process that started in October, um, gathering all of the requests from Health Science Center from each of the units. They came up to our leadership, which is we call our core group. Uh, we actually went through them three separate times to make sure we had um, uh, agreement um, I will say that there is uh, four items on the one that showed up in F and F that had the main campus on it for HSC, and only three here. So after that one was done, HED came back and requested us to go down to three items and not four. So we then reprioritized and we took the College of Pharmacy. Uh, planning for the building off and we are going to work on trying to fund that internally over the next two years and, and since we had to take one off. So these three items, the first one being the simulation activities, that one is, you know, how we've gone more and more to teaching um, uh, clinical um, skills with simulation, with mannequins, with software. And so enhancing that is just huge, especially, you know, in this current environment. And it is less expensive than trying to get uh, people out into clinical areas. So that one is, is um, uh, across the health science center. It's not just nursing, not just pharmacy, not just school medicine, it's everybody um, can use that simulation and, and increasing our simulation uh, center. And so then Ava, including the branch campuses, I know that that was something that was big in Gallup uh, with the paramedics and the fire, if I recall correctly. Yes, I and I would have to defer. Dr. Levi is the expert in all of this. I'm the kind of the financial person, but um, she um, has put this together with all the deans, and and I assume that also includes uh, whoever else could use this. And it could certainly benefit from the work we're doing here and training them in Gallup. I would think. So then that next one is just. Our, our Rio Rancho uh, Orthopedic Center of Excellence has been approved all the way through the State Board of Finance. And so this is for some new equipment, some extra equipment out there to do more uh, research and teaching um, at, for uh, in the rehab and orthopedic areas. And that's what that request is. And then as you said, the Cancer Center Vault comes back from last year, didn't get funded last year, and, and is very much needed and comes back again. And so those are the requests for the current year for the HSC. And Regent Brown, if I may, with regard to the um, orthopedics, they, they've been long needing yeah. um, assistance and it's sort of a catch-22, if I'm not mistaken. They're kind of our bread and butter, but we've hamstrung them with not being able to compete with our private you know, competitors in the marketplace for, with uh, equipment and and facilities. So, I, with those questions, I would move approval of this. Is there is there a second? I'm sorry, who was that second? Sandra, second. Sandra, okay, thank you. Uh, are there further comments or questions? Hearing none, I'd I'd uh, ask for approval by uh, Regent Doty. Yes. Regent Swartz. Yes. Regent Henry. Yes. Regent Sanchez Real. Yes. I vote it's unanimous. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, there's no closed session. 
Um, um, oh, excuse me, Regent so, Brown, one more item. We need yeah. the five-year plan for HSC capital projects to be approved by the board. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought that was covered before, but all right. Let's go with that. Do you want to? Uh, this is in addition to you, the last um, addition to the last item, but again, this was an issue that was um, uh, noticed by the uh, Health Science Committee, but not in fact acted upon. Yeah, I would like to request that these things, all these financial capital projects, somehow be lumped together because I think we've uh, invite confusion here. So let's proceed on this five-year capital plan for HSC. Those items. Um, Rob, are you making that motion? Sure, I'll move that we approve that five-year plan. Is there a second? I'll second, this is Regent Henry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regent Lee? Yes. Regent Doty? Regent, Regent Doty, sorry, Regent- Sorry, yes, yes, yes. Regent Begay? Yes. And I will vote yes, it's unanimous. Uh, is, are there any other items that I overlooked? Regent President Brown? Yes. This is uh, Provost Holloway. Um, I just would like to note that uh, after an extraordinary term, we shouldn't miss the fact that we just graduated 4,700 new Lobos. Uh, and I think uh, uh, while there won't be a graduation this Friday, we should give them a round of applause. I agree. Actually, this is the, this is the round, this is the virtual applause symbol. No, that's yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and thanks to everybody for, for going through uh, this maiden voyage on a full virtual meeting and I appreciate your patience for taking us through almost four hours, uh, but it was a very meaty, meaningful meeting and your participation was terrific and your preparation by all presenters and I thank you very much and we'll go through into June with, with all appendages crossed that will be presented with something that we can live with and thrive with. And again, Ryan, um, Ryan Gregg and, and Adam Biederwolf and, and all the advisors who were changing over, uh, you've been terrific and Godspeed and we, we thank you so much. Regent Brown, there's a few advisors that would like to, to say a few words. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, that wasn't at that point on the agenda. So, okay, let's do that. Advisors um, comments now. Okay, didn't hit, didn't hit my agenda for some reason. Okay, Adam. Yeah, awesome, I'd love to speak. So thank you, President Brown and members of the board. Um, I'll keep this quick just because we've been here for a while, but um, I just wanna thank you all for an incredible year. I wanna thank oh, you for um, listening to the student voice you know, during decision-making processes. Um, I wanna thank Provost Holloway for his work, um, all the leadership at the university, obviously President Stokes, um, you know, I really just kind of want to talk about the adjustments that we've made as a university and the adjustments that President Stokes has made, you know, with online learning and with online graduation. Um, God, I hate to get emotional, but um, my fellow students, myself, we've been going through a lot this semester, um, you know, trying to milk the last bits of our Lobo experience in our living rooms and um, trying to accept a virtual graduation. Um, but I think there's always silver linings to any tough situation. And I, I think for this situation in particular, um, you know, my fellow students were all learning one of the core elements to life, and that is perseverance. Um, so in the next couple of years, when all this madness ends, um, I, I, I hope you guys understand that myself and my fellow students, we're going to be making the biggest contributions, the biggest impacts, not only to New Mexico, but across the country. And I am so happy and I'm so grateful to have you all as the leadership of this university because it has given me so many opportunities and it has been the best experience of my life. Um, so thank you all so, so much. Um, with that being said, she is not here, unfortunately, but um, the next ASUNM president is uh, Mia Amin. She's an incoming senior studying business administration and you all are so, so lucky to have her because she's one of the greatest leaders that I know on this campus. So um, I know that she's gonna do an incredible job, but um, again, I just wanna thank you all for, for an incredible year. Thank you. Virtual applause to Adam, please. Okay, Afsal. 
you so much, uh, Regent Brown and all the Board of Regent and, and all the UNM leadership. So first of all, I, I really want to thank our UNM leadership and the members of the Board of Regent and, and how, how important it was at the time when we have to make the tough decision and they came up with very, very creative creative decision and, and help our not only our UNM, but all the community. So I, I really want to give a big shout out to you all for working in this, you know, unprecedented time and, and all this challenging circumstances. And, uh, and I am really humbled and, and, and it was a, a wonderful opportunity and honor to represent and being for being a voice of all the graduate and professional students at UNM and working with all of you and 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 all the decision making to help alleviate and help to make a better decision and I'm really thankful for the opportunity that was given to me and I believe this was one of the best decisions I have ever made to not only come to UNM but also representing the students voice and and that really i don't want to miss the opportunity and this actually has given me an opportunity to recognize the importance of giving back to the communities and i believe my next life experience will be definitely be will be reshaped by this experience of being at unm and being the president of gpsa because I, I really want to go back to, our, to different communities. I don't know where I'll be, but I would like to give back to the communities. And, and if I would like, if I got a chance, we'll definitely will work to alleviate UNM and, and help to lift the New Mexico communities. And I want to thank Pres President Stokes, all the members of the Board of Region, and all the UNM leadership for their response and working hard to make the very best decision and and especially to the Duane Arodi because he this was a tough job for him to come up with all this this you know initiative to help doing all the campus operations going online so I really want to thank him for his services as well and I want to congratulate all the graduates uh, all the students who are graduating and and I know this was not they are going through a lot but that's why we are prepared at UNM and that's why we are Lobos. So I really wanted to thank everyone for being very strong in this challenging time. And, and I wish good luck to them for the future endeavors and, and we are Lobos forever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aksa. You've been terrific. You've really helped further activate the graduate students. Really appreciate your help. Thank you. Uh, Vinnie Coleman. Is Finney here? Yes, I'm here. I'm, 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 I'm here. Um, so I, I also want to echo all of the comments that have been made so far this year. I think um, this class um, of graduating seniors is a remarkable class. Um, I, I just, I have so much, um, you know, I feel so badly that this class won't have the traditional graduation that um, that that we're so used to here at this university, I think um, this this um, this horrible horrible um, crisis, um, I think has, has has demonstrated to me at least um, just how important the ceremonial life is of our university, um, and how much and how important it is for us to maintain our traditions. Um, you know, going and, and and having faculty and staff participating in those those traditions along with our with our students. So I'm looking forward to graduation when we when we have it. Congratulations to that class. Um, congratulations to all the student leader leaders and my buddy Ryan for everything that they've done this year. Um, this was my first year as faculty senate president and it's been one of the most most um, fulfilling and uh, just just um, mind expanding years of my professional career. I'm very thankful to the provost and the president for their uh, their, their guidance and, and, and help in terms of professional development um, as well, especially the provost. Uh, so thanks for, for everything that they've done this year. We are going to form three ad hoc committees that like for the fact for the 
Board of Regents to be aware of. The first of these um, will address some of the policy alignment issues that we as faculty think are important to address, making sure that all of our policies are aligned and are in compliance with, um, with the Board of Regents policy. So we will, we will forward uh, an ad hoc committee, um, a reform and ad hoc committee to address those, uh, to address those issues um, and come to the Board of Regents, obviously with uh, recommendations uh, in terms of policy alignment. Um, we, we are forming a, an ad hoc committee that will work with the various stakeholders around campus to look at branch campus uh, students and their persistence rates. And then finally, we'll, um, we, we will um, form an ad hoc committee that will look at race um, and campus climate um, this, this coming year. All of these ad hoc committees have a two-year lifespan, one year of study, and then one year of implementation implementation. Um, I'm a member of the faculty um, that was um, implicated, threatened in this horrific racist attack on Africana studies um, here recently. And, you know, I want to thank all of those um, individuals around our campus who rallied and sent letters of support to Africana studies. Um, I can tell you that those letters meant a great deal to, to all of us who are within that community. I had an interesting conversation um, actually in Walmart with Martha McGrew. Um, and, one, and one of the messages, messages that I'd like to send to our community is a, a very simple one. Um, we're long past the moment when we have the luxury of imagining that these attacks are solely on the black community. These are attacks on every person of color on our campus. And that means every person on our color, independent of what they might imagine themselves to be racially, culturally, politically, what have you. These are, an, these are attacks on our community. And we, when we can start to see it that way, as opposed to it's an attack on them, those people over there, we'll have come a long way as an institution. Leadership conference will be in August. We have a newly seated faculty senate and we continue to fill uh, committee chairs and look for a statement from um, faculty governance regarding the difference between faculty governance and shared governance. And want to continue to encourage the university to take seriously um, the, the, um, the concerns of faculty have, who have unionized. Um, you know, faculty governance um, remains neutral in terms of having, um, you know, a, a position on whether we should or should not unionize, but absolute unflinching support for our colleagues um, who have chosen to take on this incredible um, uh, effort to unionize. And we hope the uni university will continue to respect us as faculty and understand that this is a powerful watershed moment in our university's history where we can truly demonstrate to the rest of the country what the kind of inclusive excellence we have on our campus and model for the rest of the country what these relationships can look like. We don't want to replicate what has happened before. I encourage University Council, uh, the President's Office, the Provost um, to continue to try to respect this process and, and to listen to what my colleagues are sharing about their concerns with unionization. Um, with that said, thank you for an, an absolutely wonderful year. Regent Brown, appreciate your leadership and the rest of the regents. Thank you very much for the moment to, uh, for the opportunity to address the board. Well, Fanny, thanks for your wise and sensitive comments. And we so look forward to your continued leadership. Thank you. Ryan Gregg. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I think I actually have some Perfect, some slides here for you. Uh, so I'm working right up until the last moment. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to give you what I would normally you know, give to the board as a presentation. Uh, so I just wanted to give you some quick updates. Uh, we have been certainly impacted in terms of process and personhood uh, by COVID-19. And we've heard a lot about you know, what has gone on for, um, for our students and for our faculty for sure. But I, I wanna just underscore and reiterate that you know, the first time I spoke to the board, I gave that great, at least great in my opinion, 
um, you know, perspective of staff as the, the skeletal system. And so the ability of the university staff to quickly be flexible and adapt to servicing our student and faculty colleagues uh, is truly remarkable. And so as I've heard from individual staff, I've been absolutely um, flabbergasted by their ability to very quickly uh, be flexible. And so I'd like also to extend a thanks to Duane and the IT folks because they're ensuring this can happen for us. Uh, and, and I think it's really important to, to talk about. Uh, you may or may not have heard that the staff council initially postponed its elections. Uh, we have elections each year for representatives from the various grades or precincts. And so we postponed those elections because they were scheduled to be the week right of spring break. So we were headed right into it and we weren't really sure how many people were going to be able to get access, how they would actually um, engage with the, the election. Uh, subsequent to that though, our constitution does require that they be held in the spring semester. And so uh, we held them the first week in May because we thought that we could actually get to a place where we could deliver some access and we had some unprecedented solutions to solving those access challenges, uh, but we did reschedule them and I'm happy to report to the board and to the university community that we had more people vote in this election uh, than we did last year. So our outreach efforts were successful, at least I think in, in my opinion, uh, but we are going to move forward and address further considerations for how we increase access to the vote going forward. We also instituted a staff council diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Uh, I consider myself to be a person who's really attentive to these issues, but we can't rely on you know, one person in one position to think they're that important. And so uh, we thought it was a, a really shrewd practice to create something that would ensure that we take these issues seriously. Uh, and they've been very helpful so far, certainly in trying to extend the access to that election. Our staff, uh, as staff council president, I also participated in a staff and faculty virtual town hall that was organized by the university's DEI, uh, and that was very helpful. And then we're also continuing to work on our, our five-year strategic plan. Our current one expires this year, and so hopefully in a month or so, we will have uh, a, a detailed five-year plan. Next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, I also want to introduce here some great pictures of uh, myself along with the new president of the staff council. Uh, Nancy Shane is a program evaluator in the School of Medicine. She's a precinct representative on the council and she's been a member since 2015. So uh, I am fully confident that Nancy will be able to hit the ground running. She's had a great year um, serving as president elect and uh, she's ready to, to take over and, and I'll be here in the role of past president. So. I, I'll still be involved a little bit in the mix, but you won't see me, you'll see Nancy. Next slide, please. Uh, we did also continue our uh, tradition of having our staff as students event. We do this once each semester, but this actually was done uh, totally virtually this year. And I wanna extend special thank you to um, Deborah Kiltika, Associate Director in Admissions, and to Sheila Jernak, our registrar. They developed a process as to waive the fees for applications if a staff person needed uh, to apply to the university. And then they also then worked to ensure that the registration, the early registration could be completed. So without their help, uh, we definitely wouldn't have been able to do this. And so I'm really excited about um, the way that we were able to, to adapt again and make sure that staff could register for their courses. Next slide, please. And then, because this is my last opportunity to speak to all of you, I wanted to highlight uh, one area that reached out to me and I learned about the work that they're doing uh, that I thought was really important to include so that you know uh, some of the important work being done by staff to get through this really difficult time. So probably everyone's familiar with Project ECHO. They have about 100 staff and 40 faculty and they normally provide between 30 and 35 programs in their effort to reach all the different areas, not just in New Mexico, but globally, to export those really fantastic medical uh, content that they've got. But they stopped all of those programs so that they could build 12 COVID-19 specific programs. And since they did that in March, they've had over 10,000 attendees at those 12 COVID-19 programs. Next slide, please. 
So here, I just want to briefly show you some of these things and then talk about the one that I heard about and how I got involved with them. But they're actually helping to make sure that every person who needs these pieces of information can get them. So infectious diseases, critical care, um, multi-specialty, first responder resiliency, community health workers, and et echo education. Those were all things they developed very quickly to make sure that we could take what we know works and export that so that communities dealing with COVID-19 can also uh, benefit from that knowledge that we have. And then there are also some special sessions, and this is where I got involved. Uh, the first special session that they created was uh, a collaboration between the ECHO Institute, UNM, and the Department of Health and the New Mexico Health Services Division. The second they created was uh, COVID-19 safety topics for New Mexico early childhood professionals. They provided education related to the physical, mental, and emotional well-being of very young children, their parents, and early childhood teachers. And then the third, and this is where I got involved, was a special session which was virtual online education for parents to educate parents of school-age children regarding the online education, critical information uh, systems that schools are now asking parents to get involved with. So Project ECHO, I really wanna shout them out and make sure they, that everyone knows the amazing work they've been doing. Uh, and it's a great collaboration between faculty and staff, but there are a lot of staff who, who are involved in, so that's why I wanted to highlight them. Uh, I think I might have one more fun slide. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So this, I just wanted to give you one last thing. This was probably the, the thing that made me the happiest over the last uh, year. And I'll, I'll just take a couple more seconds to wax poetic maybe, or maybe not poetic, but wax anyhow, um, to just talk about this last year of service. Uh, it's been dramatic. We've had some fantastic highs, but we also find ourselves um, among some deep lows at the moment. And I'm hopeful that, that these comments are going to be heard not just by the regents, but everyone, because I feel like it's important. Uh, I really, truly believe that getting involved has made a huge difference, uh, especially looking forward. University decisions are tough, but UNM has really exceptional structures for shared governance. And certainly since President Stokes' arrival, we've recommitted to those structures of shared governance. And staff and staff council have worked with administration to do some really great things this year. We instituted paid parental leave. We're still finalizing, but we created a pilot program to give recent graduates who have disclosed a disability the opportunity to secure professional intern positions among our staff so that they can get that work experience that research has shown us is not always available for these students. And we also worked with the legislature, government affairs, uh, the budget leadership team and administration to, to get to that 4% comp number. Uh, and, you know, I know that this could change and I really want you to know that I'm trying to do my best to convey to staff that Compensation is realistically a function of what the state does for us. And so uh, we should pay very close attention to that. But at least for me, the point is that if we as constituencies of the university take initiative and get involved in these shared governance structures, we can work together to make UNM the best place to work, live, and learn. And maybe it's because this is my last meeting, but I, I just want to go a little farther, if you'll permit me, and say that I want to really caution members of the university constituencies, especially now, not to make flippant, simple suggestions about which programs we might just cut to solve our challenges. It's really easy to suggest something like, let's just cut football, but in many cases, it's ignorant of the, the factors that surround those programs. And my point is that each of us has to be taken seriously, but we can only do that if we do our research and if we do our homework. And when it comes to staff and staff council, I'm proud to say I think we did that. Um, I certainly know it's not easy, but it is the responsible way to engage in this work because none of us is an island and we're all in this together. So let me just end by saying I'm thankful for and grateful to Adam, Muhammad, Alexis, Finney, Bev, uh, Randy for their thoughtful leadership um, because we know this is important. And I'm really thankful to you, members of the board, President Stokes and other administrators for your continued commitment to those shared governance processes because we've been able to do a lot. And so I'm hoping in a year we can look back and see that most of the COVID impacts are behind us and, and get back to the business of expanding UNM to fulfill the, that goal of being the university for New Mexico. So thank you, I appreciate it. Ryan, thank you so much for a very active, productive year. And we certainly look forward to working with Nancy. Also wanna thank you for all your help in the admissions and enrollment area. Uh, I, I know you've been a real stalwart there, and thank you for that too. We're Beverly, do you have, Beverly, do you have some comments? Yes, I sure do. Um, am I unmuted? 
Can you? No, hear? you're live. You're live. Okay, great, uh, great. I'd like to thank everyone for that opportunity um, to serve this last year as UNM uh, Retiree Association president. And I'd like to just highlight a few things um, that the Retiree Association's done. Um, we've really appreciated our enhanced collaboration um, with the university, uh, specifically um, with the Human Resources Department and their, as they're providing our administrative support and helping us um, with membership tracking and listserv um, consolidation, their help is greatly appreciated. Um, we established this year four $250 scholarships um, for, to help students with the cost of books and fees. Um, we've sponsored several social and educational programs, including Successful Aging um, with Janice Knofel and tours of the Brain Exhibit and the Jim Henson Exhibit at our local museums. We sponsored a, a coffee hour at the Flying Star before COVID, um, and we had a uh, well-attended holiday um, open house. Although the short legislative session was mostly focused on PARA and a retirement program this year, our legislative committee worked hard to educate legislators about the importance of the ERB retirement program to the recruitment and retention of the state's educators. Um, we were proud that one of our UNM uh, uh, RA board members, uh, Joyce Sabo, was uh, elected to serve on the national board of AROKI, which is the Association of Retirement Organizations in Higher Education. It's always nice to see people get involved at the national level. Uh, we did a lot of reconfiguring of our website and throughout the year contemplated how to increase our value as an organization serving UNM retirees. Uh, and finally, um, we're trying to figure out, as is the rest of the world, how um, we need to change our approach and outreach uh, during this pandemic as we represent um, a pretty vulnerable population, uh, at least by age. Um, so that's a little bit of the wrap up of the year so far. And thank you again for the support of the UNM Retiree Association. I certainly enjoyed uh, the time I've spent uh, working with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly, and I am one of you. So I, I particularly thank you. Uh, if there's no other items, I don't see, I didn't see the advisor come as tucked away on page top of three. Uh, I think it's now appropriate for adjournment. Is there a, a motion to adjourn? So moved, Marin. Marin, okay, second. Second by Sandra. Sandra, thank you. I'll take those votes in the affirmative. Regent Doty. Uh, yes, move to adjourn. Or Re Re Regent Schwartz. I vote yes. Re Regent Henry. Yes. Regent Sanchez Rao. Yes. And I vote yes. And I again thank everybody. I really do appreciate a very substantive meeting. Thank you, and we'll see you, I'm sure, in June. Take Thank care. You. <clears throat>